Assalamu alaikum guys. Oh man. Assalamu alaikum guys. Welcome to episode 34 Freshly Grounded. This is probably this is such a special episode. Um, as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube or probably here because it doesn't sound like I'm in the studio, um, I'm currently in the UAE. I'm in Dubai. Um, Sam's not here, unfortunately. Um, the, that all of Sam not being here and me being around and, and us not being able to do an episode in the studio is is all my fault to be honest because I'm um, I had to travel this week and originally I thought we were not going to get an episode out this week which I was so upset about Sam was so upset about. Um, because we really wanted to get an episode out and it was my fault because I was away and Alhamdulillah Allah had something so much better planned for us and for Freshly Grounded and it's that we've got this episode here today um, and it's an episode where with Sheikh Ustad uh, a beautiful teacher um, Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble who I'll, I'll talk about more in a second um, but he basically lives out here in the UAE. We managed to hit him up and he agreed to do a podcast with us. And it is a most amazing podcast. Um, quickly, I'll go into the sponsors before I talk about exactly what we talk about and who exactly Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble is. Um, but yeah, guys, this is a different episode in the sense that it's not me and Sam, but a very special and so far my favorite episode of Freshly Grounded. Even though we say that every episode, it really, really is. Um, this episode then is brought to you by 5950 underscore N-I-N-E on Instagram, 59 Coffee and Juice Bar in St. Albans, Hertfordshire. If you're in and around St. Albans, make sure you pop there. It's honestly one of my favorite coffee shops. Um, if you head there this month, uh, well, every month, whenever you head there, if you quote Freshly Grounded, you always get um, some kind of discount, some kind of freebie, um, maybe that being an energy, energy ball, maybe being a tote bag. Um, so do check that out. Also brought to you by Izaha, I-Z-A-H-A dot com, Izaha dot com. If you type um, freshly grounded in the cart for Izaha, you get 20% off um, any and everything. Um, Arabic style caps, Arabic style jumpers, t-shirts, hats. Um, also podcast, this episode is brought to you by Flavor. You can tell that I'm like really just powering through these sponsorships because I really want to talk about Ustad Muhammad Tim. Um, also brought to you by Flavor, your one-stop shop for branding, marketing, iPhone applications, web design, but mainly social content creation for your social media platform. So if you have a business, let's say you own a uh, car dealership and um, your social media sucks and your Instagram content sucks, um, what Flavor do, what we do at Flavor is we have a team of amazing creatives. You have a creative director who's amazing at what he does and um, photographers, videographers, and we create the content for your um, for example, Instagram feed. Um, and then we give that content to you so your Instagram feed looks good and we focus on theme, um, personalize it to your brand. It's amazing. Um, hit us up at flavor.co, F-L-A-V-R.co. And lastly, brought to you by Kalima. Uh, Kalima is a Dawa and it's a Dawa Institute, an Islamic organization based in the United Arab Emirates. Um, Kalima has, first of all, um, classes on, on, I believe, almost a daily basis, at least classes or events for um, people who are trying to study the deen. Um, Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble is actually one of the teachers at Kalima. He's actually, as you'll find out in this podcast, one of, if not the only English-speaking da'i in Dubai, um, especially who's doing it to this uh, degree level, uh, to this level of degree and w with this much knowledge. Um, Allahumma barik. Um and um they've had they, they they also focus a lot on new muslims um they've actually taken over 1400 1400 shahadas which is amazing they've got over 5000 students they teach in nine different languages and they have over 71 different seminars and workshops so if you're in the uae you're listening to this in the uae or you're just a huge fan of Ustad tim humble um do look into studying with kalima right so this episode right here, guys, um, Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble is someone that me and Sam really have listened to a lot and we've benefited from a lot for a number of years before we even knew him or knew people who knew him. And before me and Sam even knew that each other benefited of him, I remember one time we had a phone call and we, I was speaking about Ustad Tim Humble and um, Sam was like, do you know what? I was just about to mention that to you, that how weird is that we've never mentioned him on the podcast when we both benefit of him so much. And... Um, <clears throat> it's just he, he just does he you know he he he's 
let me tell you about his credentials. So, uh, Usama Muhammad Tim Humble converted to Islam at the age of 14. Yes, 14 years old. And we talk about that in this episode. Why, um, how a 14-year-old boy from Newcastle finds a dean and accepts a dean. Um, how he eventually... Um, joined um graduated and studied at the islamic university of medina he studied at the islamic university of medina the, the trials and tribulations kind of he went went through um some lessons he learned from that, those experiences um he actually um oh what was i gonna say I'm literally, this is like completely like off script right now because I'm just trying to like power this intro out real quick. Um, yeah, he specialized in hadith, <coughs> specialized in hadith in Islamic University of Medina. And now he teaches out here. We talk about his children, which we, we talk about how they are homeschooled and why he's a really, he's really kind of pro, pro homeschooling, although he's not anti regular schooling, but very pro homeschooling um, and how he does it. We talk about his daily routine. What is the daily routine of a student of knowledge to his degree? Someone who's graduated from the Islamic University of Medina. Like this is, he's very, very humble as um, his name suggests, <laughs> but he will play it like he's not um, like a big deal, but you know, he's a wealth of knowledge. Um, may Allah bless him, may Allah preserve him. I mean, and we talk about his daily routine. What's his ideal daily routine? How can you guys uh, um, take on that daily routine? A daily routine of a productive person. Um, you know, um, many, many other things, many things. Like he gives some advice, uh, beautiful advices. Um, he talks about how hard it is for him to say no to certain things, but how he obviously gets a lot of people asking him to do a lot of things. Um, and he's now like learning to say no uh, to more things because it's actually Islamically better to say no than to say yes and not be able to keep your promise. We talk about all of that. We talk about adhkar, when to do your adhkar, how should you do your adhkar, should you do your evening adhkar after Asr, should you do it after Maghrib, um, uh, you know, how to how to start praying to hajjad like this is another big thing for us like how how do i get on like yes i'm, I'm doing my five prayers a day you know i'm i'm ready to take that step to start praying to hajjad but how do i start like i can't just wake up in the third of the night you know two hours before fajr and do you know 16 rakat and into my witter at the end of it I'm, i'll be too tired how do you do it all of this he goes into you know um traffic we talk a lot about traffic dubai versus uk where's better to live Honestly, guys, it's just so much. Let's get straight into the episode because I don't want to, I know I've already wasted a lot of time, but this is a very, very special episode that I'm very, very, very excited to release. Um, oh, my last thing is this, that if you guys are hearing this on a podcast app, but it's not out on YouTube right now, it's just because I'm in UAE right now and I'm, I'm, I'll am i be lucky to, um, well, I don't, we don't believe in luck, I suppose, but um, it'll be very great if I can even get the audio out by Friday, um, but the the video, I'm almost definitely sure that it won't be out until I hit back into the UK. So either way, this is episode 34, guys. It's a great one. Without any further ado, it's Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble. And welcome to Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast by best friends, Faisal and Sam. Huh? I, welcome, I said, welcome to Freshly Grounded. The... No, after that bit. The brand new podcast. And after that bit? My best friends, Facebook and Sam. Really? Okay, so the person I am currently with right now, um, I, I'm afraid that I have, I have to do the intro for this person, for this teacher, after we've actually recorded the <laughs> episode, mainly because... I'm conscious that I don't want dirt thrown in my face. <laughs> and I also know that this teacher would not like the things that I will say. Um, but he's a teacher that um, I very much so have a lot of love and respect for. Abdul Samad has a lot of love and respect for. And he's very, very upset that he's not here right now. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're here with Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble. Um, and we're in the United Arab Emirates. I, I'm. I've. I've managed to like slip myself away. Um, I, alhamdulillah, I actually have a very patient wife because I'm meant to be uh, spend. I, I prom- so I'm here for work, and we have a all, we have a full day of meetings on Thursday, and we have. Um, so I'm. I'm me and my brother are just completely not with our wives on Thursday, and on Friday we're pretty much away as well. And I'm I'm leaving Saturday morning, and so I said to my wife, "Look, we'll go out." Because I told her, "Look, why don't you come with me? Take some time off work. We'll get we'll go on a nice little break. I'm going for work as well, but we, we'll get some time away." And um, 
I said, what I can promise you is I'll give you all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday. And after that, I'm busy Thursday and a bit of Friday. And she said, fine. And then when we got here, I said, I sat down, I sat down just before we flew and I said, uh, listen, I have one thing that I have to do, but I promise um, I'm going to do it oh, straight after Fajr because she'll go, she'll go to sleep after Fajr. And so... Um, she sleep when I said, I said, by the time you wake up, I'll be back. And I said, I, I've got podcasts with Muhammad Tim, Osama Muhammad Tim. And uh, surprisingly, alhamdulillah, because I only gave her two days, she was very, very um, okay with it, very patient, because uh, she knows that I really wanted to get this episode out. So may Allah bless her. And, I mean. <laughs> and uh, wow, there's so much to go into. First of all, Ustad, um, we're in the UAE and you're out here in the UAE. This is literally where you live. How long have you lived out here now? I've been here for three years. Okay. So just to give you a bit of background, I graduated from the Islamic University of Medina uh, in 2000, early 2011. And then from there, I went back to the UK. And I stayed in the UK for a few years. Um, I was probably in the UK for maybe three years, roughly, something like that. Uh, and then I came over here um, because I started, I mean, I, I give lectures all over. So uh, one of the places I came to give a lecture was to Dubai. Okay. And actually Dubai really surprised me because Dubai doesn't have a great reputation in, in many respects, yeah. you know, like in terms of for practicing Muslims to go there. Um, and so I kind of got this sort of bad impression having gone once before. Like every tourist, you go, you land at the airport, you go to a hotel that is like nearby somewhere or on one of the, you know, on the main road, Sheikh Zayed Road. And that's what you see of Dubai. And you kind of get the impression that that's what Dubai is like. Uh, I came here for a lecture. So when you when you say that's the, uh, that's the impression, do you mean like the, the idea of it being kind of very modern, westernized. Very westernized, right, right. very sort of not very Islamic. Okay, yeah. When I went there, I couldn't find like really easy, easily find a place to pray, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I came for a lecture uh, and obviously the brothers who brought me for a lecture, those guys actually live here and they, they showed me that the vast majority of Dubai is nothing like what the, the the impression you get from going to like some five star hotel on you know Sheikh Zayed Road, it's actually a really really nice place to live, and it has a a really nice balance between um, the fact that it's quite it, 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 you know you have all of the modern things that you would want in a city, and you know you can go out and enjoy yourself, and there are nice places to go, and it's it's a beautiful place. Uh, there's you know everything from you know the beach and the sea uh, you know it's one of my things I like diving so oh, really yeah I'm, I'm into free diving that so surprises me I'm into diving without without an oxygen tank no yeah so you like can you hold your breath hold for long breath. yeah you know to, I, I, I can do like three minutes now subhanallah um, maybe a bit over in the water so uh, like that's one thing but then you've also got the you know you've also got the this, this sort of city centre and all the shops you need and everything like that but at the same time, it is a place where there's a lot of Islam. Like I feel as a practicing Muslim and with a family here who practice Islam, I feel really comfortable here. You know, I never feel out of place. I never feel like I might in, in, in the UK, in the, you know, in the middle of a city center where I kind of like a bit apprehensive, yeah. you know, wearing my, you know, Arab style dress and what have you, you know. So Or praying in the middle of the road pray, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, you don't feel that here. You feel totally, totally comfortable. And I saw a side of Dubai that I hadn't seen as a tourist just stopping off at the airport for 24, 48 hours, I saw a totally different side. And I thought, you know, this is a place that I could live. This is a place I could definitely live. So they offered me an opportunity to come here and teach. And I work with new Muslims, teaching new Muslims. So that's what I did. I came over here. I've been here for three years and just renewed my stay again for at, maybe at least another another year or so. Okay. So, so Dubai versus UK. I know you've kind of gone over the... Um, Dubai, uh, I mean, I mean, UK generally in regards to Islamic um, environment and that kind of stuff. But Dubai versus UK, Dubai, UK is always going to be your home. It's where your majority of your family will be. What are the pros and cons? Where's better? To, and you're speaking to somebody who is very much so on the edge of wanting to move here. <laughs> so if you give me two seconds, I'm going to move. Is your mic, mic up conscious? Though? Yeah. We do try now. If you just try to say something. Yeah, testing one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so uh, Dubai versus UK. Okay, so, um, I mean, home is home. 
right. and I miss the UK. And I also I also really like the UK. Like I have a lot of good to say about it. You know, in terms of Europe, I think it's the best place that a Muslim can live, or one of the best places that a Muslim can live in in Europe, definitely. And if you look at like what it's what it must be like for for Muslims to live in places like France or Germany, um, uh, places like Holland, mm. where there's a lot of anti-Islamic sentiment among uh, the non-Muslim community, where there's a lot of restrictions, where there's problems on on the women who, for example, cover themselves and things like that. I mean, the UK, we are really blessed that we don't have that. And there's some good Muslim communities, you know, like uh, my wife comes from Birmingham. Okay. So Birmingham has is, is got a great Muslim community. Uh, likewise, you know, London has a great Muslim community. And there are other cities as well, in some Manchester and what have you. And also where I'm from in Newcastle. So I'm like from, yeah, and as far as you guys are concerned, the middle of nowhere, right? Well, I lived, I, as I told you last time, I lived with um, uh, uh, somebody in university who's from Newcastle. And he, um, he would always say, what did I say that he always said? Um, What's this thing that um, used to always howe? That's it. Howe. And so we'd always say howe to him. His name was yeah. Harry. We'd be like, howe, Harry. Or like just howe, man. And so, yeah. Well, I, I didn't realize there was like any Muslim community in, in Newcastle. Yeah, there's a decent community. Decent community. Nice uh, nice masjid we have as well. And alhamdulillah, you know, it's, it's a good place. And people are very friendly. And I generally, you know, without stereotyping, like the, you know, when you go to the north of the UK, you do get that, a different kind of culture. It's true. You know, people away from the work culture more, people are more kind of open and friendly and family oriented and stuff, you know, regardless of religion. So I think it's, you know, it's a nice place. So I do, li- I do appreciate the UK. I don't like to sort of come on these whatever shows, TV podcasts, etc., and, you know, say, oh, the UK is a terrible place and, you know, we all should move and go away. You know, actually, the UK is a, a big blessing because, you know, if you look at the rest of Europe, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a good place we're in. It's true. And especially being, I think there's this like idea in the UK that, you know, it is very anti-Islamic and stuff. But I don't, I don't know if it's because I live in London, which is a very kind of metropolitan city. But, you know, when it comes to Salah, when it comes to, um, I don't know, anything to do with practicing Generally, there's no. I, I haven't really come across any issues. Mm. I've never. I've not ever. Alhamdulillah, I've I've not really come across any any Islamophobia, which I know is still rife in the UK. It's not to say that it doesn't exist. I know there's a lot of people who do go through it. Um, but Alhamdulillah, you know, even pr- sometimes when you have to pray Salah um, and people see you and stuff like that, it's not. I haven't experienced it to the extent to which you hear in other European countries, as you were saying. It's quite bad in other European countries. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the sad thing is, the concerning thing is that it's on the rise. It's on the rise everywhere, though. But I think it's, you know, we have a lot of good things in the UK. Generally, we have, I I believe most most non-Muslims in the UK are understanding of Islam. I really believe that most of them are are, are not anti-Islam. There are a minority that are becoming increasingly vocal. And those guys are what, you know, we, we do get concerned because... They're becoming. They've got more of a voice than mm, they ever used yeah, to have. Yeah. Uh, but as long as you know, especially that the legal framework and the laws, they don't give you any problems. Uh, you know, I think it's as if you compare, if you look at Europe, UK is one one of the best places to live as a Muslim. One of the things, I mean, uh, that th- though you know, especially coming from Newcastle and coming from you know, sort of, it's Dubai definitely in terms of just the the standard of living is definitely higher. But that comes with a price. It's more expensive. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. very expensive. And so, you know, when you go, people can tell you, you know, you're going to go to Dubai and there's this salary and that salary. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. You know, like, why did I ever think about being in the UK? And then they tell you the rent and you're like, ah, I see. And now I know why the salary is, uh, now I know why the salary is like that. And subhanAllah, even the shopping, if if you go to H&M in Dubai more and you go to H&M in London, the same uh, the same clothes cost so much more here. Yeah, I'm sure they import them and they just, you know, like put that premium on there. Yeah. So it has a premium for living there, but the standard of living is really, really nice. And one of the things that, you know, from a purely dunya perspective, a worldly perspective, one of the things I really like about Dubai is the fact that every you've, there's so much that you can do. Yes. I mean, if, I mean, for example, in Dubai, I regularly, I'll go horse riding, I'll go oh. diving, I go, you know, um, my friend has a boat. I go out on his boat, um, go driving dune, quad bikes and dune buggies up, you know, in the sand, uh, go to a mall. And you can do all of that in like, you know, two days. So that's something that it's quite hard to get in the UK, uh, 
not only because of the weather, but also just the way you know the way that it's laid out and the kind of facilities that you have. So Dubai is in, from a, from a worldly perspective, it's a holiday destination, right? And living in a holiday destination is you know it has its benefits. It has its benefits. Um, but I think one of the major things that I love about Dubai is definitely how it is for Muslims, because even though it's a country that is set up to welcome non-Muslims, right? Everyone agrees that the UAE is a country set up to welcome non-Muslims. Like it's a place where non-Muslims want to go, love to go, holiday there. Right. But at the same time, it's still a Muslim country. Right. And that means that still Islam is the main sort of, uh, so it's not only the main religion, but it's the main way of life, like for, for, the, for the majority of people in the country. And so you don't feel like you're a stranger. Whereas me walking through Newcastle City Centre dressed like I am now with my, you know, like sort of Arab type long uh, dress type thing on and, you know, doing what I'm doing. I think, you know, if I was to do that in Newcastle City Centre, I would feel very uncomfortable, right, even right, though I, would, right. I do it anyway, you know, yeah. even though I still do it. But, you know, I would feel like a little bit uncomfortable. And, you know, the other thing, you know, is here is the safety. It's like, I'm not going to say there's no crime here because there's crime everywhere, but there's no noticeable crime here. I oddly feel very comfortable as well. In, in that, as soon as I touch down in the UAE, I just feel like there's even coming here to Sharjah by myself. Um, there was no, there was. I mean, after I got dropped off and stuff, I was. I, was, I didn't feel any. I didn't feel any kind of uncomfort. I felt very comfortable. Um, and like you said, the one of the one of the beautiful things about being in the UAE is that it's still very. You, you you see the big brands and stuff, and you know what you're getting, and you know where you're going. If I see a nice big coffee shop, I know I know it's it's like their kind of thing. It's a bit, it's a, there's that, that comforting yeah. level, and that level. that helps especially with family uh, because I lived in Saudi for when I was in university. I was in Saudi for six years, six right. and a half years, and I don't remember. I love Saudi, and Saudi is one of the most beloved places to me. I absolutely love the place, but it is hard to live there. Mm. Like, it's it's tough. You know, you, you live there, you... I mean, now it's changing, but you live there, like, I was in Medina. We didn't have access to, like, shops that, you know, like, stuff that we would normally buy, getting stuff done, you know, getting residency permits and traveling and all. Everything was just really, really, really difficult. Here, the, the government system is better than the UK. Like, it's even... I mean, the UK is good. Like, you know what you're getting. You know how to renew your passport. You know how long it's going to take. You know how to, like, you know, apply to, I don't know, extend your house or something right, like that. Right, you, right, know, right. You, know, you know what you're doing. But here, it's even better. Like, it's even faster, although it's even more expensive. You, you pay for everything here. Because they say Dubai, you know, obviously has no tax. But the way they make up for that is they charge you for the price is up. everything. No, okay. they charge you, like, for example... To renew this, to renew it, to, to get out a driving license, they charge you a oh, huge okay. amount. To renew it, they charge you. To get to renew your visa, they charge you. To like, uh, you know, everything you, every single thing that you want to do with relate in relation to the government, they charge you for it. And that's kind of like one of the ways that they make up for that. But to me, like that's kind of like I, I don't really object to that. I right. think it's a decent way of doing things. Yeah, know? makes sense. Um, but yeah, so I mean, from a worldly perspective, Dubai has really the best, for me, the best of both worlds. Um, even, you know, there are times, yeah, for sure, when you see things that you uh, would rather you didn't see, things that you'd rather weren't there. There's no doubt about that. As sure. a practicing Muslim, you know, I would I would love for there to be a lot of things taken away and, and you know, not to come back. But at the same time, it's it, you can work around it. The pros outweigh the cons. You can, yeah, you can work around it definitely. And there's no place in the world, not even Saudi, not even Mecca. You know, there's no place in the world that doesn't have some negative things in it in terms of that have been introduced by by us, by people. You know, doing things that they uh, that they shouldn't do and so on. But Dubai, the nice thing is that you can work around it. Like there are areas that I wouldn't go to on certain days at certain times. Uh, because that ha is known for a lot. For example, there are a lot of, maybe there's some people, you know, some nightclubs there, or there's sure. a lot of like sort of non-Muslim holiday makers who aren't appropriately dressed there and things like that. But those are very, very small areas that exist just like for, you know, on certain hours in certain, right, right, certain right, times right, of the right, week. Right. It's not like it's easy like there. It's very easy to work around it. Okay. It's very easy to avoid. You, you mentioned the, um, the, the kind of government in, in Dubai and um, Islam being still being kind of like the main religion. Uh, the one thing I've noticed, and I, I mentioned this before as well, is that the um, 
you don't you, well, coming I, I might be wrong here but I, I really haven't come across a lot of kind of innovation generally like we obviously we can't I can't look into people's hearts and watch everyone but when you when I go to the, the to the masajid one thing that I find so beautiful here is that when you go to the masajid here there's the they, they have sutras laid out and stuff like that. I've never seen that in the UK and um there's just generally things that really appeal appeal to you and so how how kind of strict is the government when it comes to kind of controlling the I don't want to say controlling the Akita but controlling controlling the aspect of it and making sure things don't go out of hand with kind of bid'ah and inno- and innovation mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. No, they're very strict. They've even become, I think, uh, stricter of late, especially with the concerns with extremism and things like that. Um, th- now you you can't give a lecture in Dubai anywhere or a speech anywhere or even work in an Islamic center without going through police checks, background checks, without. Uh, you know, getting individual permission for each lecture that you want to give. Um, and, you know, alhamdulillah, I actually, I wouldn't change it. for the, I wouldn't change it. You know, w- I, Were you put through those same like, tests? I went through the same test. Okay. I went through a full police uh, background check. Um, they watch my videos regularly. Uh, like the, there are people in the police department that watch the videos regularly. Um, they monitor what you say. Uh, and I don't have any problem with that because right. I, you know, to be honest, this the, the the driving force behind that is not so much innovation in general, but specifically extremism, what we call al wa tatarruf, you know, like this right. like extremism and, you know, this like sort of terrorism and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, like a, a, a dodgy preacher can do worse, you know, more damage than, you know, than, than maybe anything else because that person can inspire, you know, even more damage than a terrorist mm. because a terrorist could, you know, kill some people. But this, like this evil sort of preacher who's spreading this message, could inspire a thousand of them, or could inspire ten thousand of them. So, to me, like them regulating it, it gives me confidence, and it also makes sure that generally, uh, things you know, the, the the kind of people who speak, generally, they, you know, it's it's good. I'm not gonna say that nothing, you know, nothing bad exists, but uh, it's. It's controlled and, you know, if somebody wants to come out with a crazy opinion or say something that's really bad or say something against Islam, they're going to find that really hard to do in an, in an Islamic context. They might be able to do that in the media, but they're going to find it hard to do in an, in an Islamic, within an Islamic context. Like they're going to find it hard to sort of preach that in a masjid or to open an Islamic center or to sort of have classes or to kind of become an Islamic personality they're not going to be able to do that without authorization. And generally, you know, they haven't put any restrictions on me. I'm, I'm, I say that openly because people always think that, you know, they mm. think that, oh, they must tell you what to say and what not to say. N- never. I mean, no one's ever come to me and said, you shouldn't say this. I speak completely freely with whatever I want. But I know that those guys are, are, are watching and kind of keeping an eye on what's been happening because at the end of the day, that's their job. And I, I get that. Like, if you don't do that, the danger is, and I mean, you look at the UK, one of the negative things you have is that, Anyone can say pretty much whatever they want. And people have said things that really can misguide a lot of Muslims and really hurt a lot of Muslims uh, and still being allowed to say that openly in the streets and, you know, stand on a podium and tell everyone, you know, that's that's dangerous. Um, so I, I like the way that it's it's controlled. It doesn't it doesn't feel a burden for me. I mean, at the Islamic Center, they apply for the permissions and everything. And I've never been refused the permission to give a, a talk anywhere. So I find it to be to be something with a lot more benefits than harms in it in this that kind of controlling situation alhamdulillah i want to carry on i want to go more into kind of um you being in ue and your kind of life right now as it is kind of in a in a bit later but i want to kind of reel it back right now you're a young boy in newcastle in the uk and i think one of the things that as you probably know surprises the most people about your story is the fact that you came to Islam at such a young age. How does a 14-year-old boy in li- living in Newcastle accept taking Shahada? I could, like, let's go into this. I'm, I'm intrigued. Okay, so um, I, I give you a slightly shorter version. Yes, please. please, please. Um, and the, the, the full version is available on YouTube. So the, Because the, the full version would take the rest of the time right, that right, we have for the enough, podcast. But enough. the shorter version is that um, I give you a bit of family background. Okay. So my family, um, I have like most of them are Church of England Protestant Christians, okay. but they're not really practicing. They're like most people, most 
Christians in the UK. You know, they go to church for a wedding, they go to church for a funeral, but they don't go every week. They don't go regularly. You know, it's not on the top of their list. But if you ask them, they would say that they were a Christian. Uh, I did have a couple of Catholics in the family, people who converted. You, know, you actually have to convert from uh, to, to go from Protestant Christianity to Catholic Christianity. You actually right. have to go through a, a set of lessons and a conversion you know, sort of process. Okay. So I had a couple of people in the family who had converted. I, my grandmother's sister, she married a Catholic. She converted to Catholicism. Um, and my grandfather, uh, on my mother's side, he was a Jehovah's Witness. This is like, the short version is, he messed around with a Ouija board, got scared by the jinn, and then a Jehovah's Witness came to him and said, you know, you need religion. And this is the religion. So that's what he did. <laughs> um, so he, uh, and that leads on to what, you know, that's the whole topic of how did I start this whole thing, the, the, you know, with Rukia and the jinn and what have you. But anyways, uh, he actually got scared by a jinni using Ouija board. And he, or well, that's what I'm, that's what my mom tells me, I think. At least that's what I can figure out. Right. And uh, he converted. And of course, when he converted, really, my grandmother his wife and my mom were not really in favor of that. Okay. You know, um, they were not really desperately religious. They were mildly, you know, like comfortably religious. But he really went into it like with, you know, he 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 dived right down to the bottom. Right. You know, like my mom used to give lectures, uh, you know, to the to the young uh, young people in the Jehovah's Witnesses and. Uh, you know, he used to ban Christmas and, you know, s celebration or what have you. And they used to celebrate Christmas in secret and, you know, all of these different things. So it was, uh, that was something. And, and then when he passed away, he passed away from a kind of cancer. Um, I think what, uh, what happened is they really pushed a, and rebelled against the, you know, that kind of religion in general. Right. You know, I'm not saying that they were, that they became atheists. They didn't, but they said we don't want anything. Like now he's passed away, we don't want anything to do with organized religion or to do with sort of um, like something as strict and as and as controlling as as Jehovah's Witnesses, okay. because they have quite a strict regime. I mean, for us as Muslims, you probably wouldn't think it to be like that. That's strict in in a certain way. Like we'd be quite like sort of like okay, but you know we have we as Muslims we have quite a strict routine and yes. you know things we can and can't do. But they, you know, for Christians, it's like a different picture, you know, completely. So my mom kind of pushed away from that. She became sort of very, sort of just a generic Christian. Who, if you ask her, she'll say she's a Christian, but. You know, ask her when she went to church. She'll just go. You know, who last got married, who last died. Right. That's the only time she ever would go to church, um, and isn't really you know particularly affiliated. If something bad happens in her life, she doesn't rush to to church to pray or something. You know, so so that's the kind of situation. And I kind of grew up. Um, I think probably the first time I even thought about religion was probably year year seven, year eight. I had a really inspiring religious education teacher. Uh, his name was Mike, and uh, he was a uh, he was a really inspiring guy. I became friends with him after uh, uh, you know later on in my life. Um, Still know him now. Uh, he sadly committed suicide actually. Subhanallah. Um, but uh, he he was a lovely lovely guy. Subhanallah. Um, and uh, he really inspired me to understand that religion isn't just what your mom and dad have like taught you. You know, like, you, you, there are actually other beliefs out there in the world. Uh, and and you know you can explore them. So I I kind of like realized that there were other religions. I don't think he told me anything specifically about Islam. I remember a bit of Sikhism, Hinduism, but I just like what what he really helped me with is just to open my mind to the fact that there are like there's a whole other world of of opinions. And how, how old are you at this age? Uh, this would be year seven, year eight. Fine. So I would be what like 11, 12, yeah. 12 years old, 12, roughly yeah. eleven, something like that. Yeah. So at that time, I went through a tough time with family. I had a bad um, he had a bad time with family. Like I was just a rebellious child, uh, getting into teenage years and, you know, fighting with my parents, doing things to annoy them, doing things to upset them and just generally being rebellious. And, and I was like that. Um, probably from a school sense, I was probably a bit spoiled in that sense because I did well, very well academically. And generally, if you do well academically, 
you get away with stuff that the other kids don't get away with. You know, like the really naughty kids who just do really like bad stuff in school, sure. they tend to be academically like really poor. Right. And so they're like threatened with getting expelled or whatever. Like it's a different thing when you're academically at the top of the class and you're messing around. Like okay. you get away with a lot. So I tended to mess around a lot. I got a, like I got in with a bad crowd. Those were the guys who were not doing very well. They were also like, you know, to be honest, they were also kind of like uh, almost at threat of getting kicked out of the school right, okay. and doing stuff they shouldn't be. But for me, I just kind of enjoyed the freedom of just messing around, but still at the same time, being able to pass, you know, get past my exams and be in the, you know, the group that I wanted to be in and what have you. So yeah, that was, uh, that was how school was in the beginning. When things got really bad, I mean, things got quite bad at home. I ran away from home. Mm -hmm. I jumped on a train around to York. So how far is York from Newcastle? That's like hundred miles. Okay. So that was an achievement for a 12 year old oh, man. But at 12 yeah. years old. So yeah. Uh, but um, not a good idea. Right. Um, I upset my mom and dad a lot. And I got myself grounded like so many times. Um, so obviously what that did is that kind of pushed me away from those friends and made me just think like, look, I need to just decide what I want to do with my life. And I did. I, Which is a big question that a 12-year-old or 30-year-old could put in their head. Yeah. And I started asking myself questions like, why am I Why am I here? Why is this happening to me? Why do I always have the, you know, the, the, the what is it? The, like, why, why do I always have bad things? And, you know, why... Am I going through so much emotional distress? And probably I was going through the same thing that every teenager goes through. Right. But for me, it was like, why me? Why this? Like, and I and I was questioning. And I was at the same time when I was grounded, and I was always a child who loved to read, and I never ever liked watching TV. Okay, so I was not. My mom would say she would switch the TV on when I was like a young child, like toddler. Yeah, she would switch the TV on, and I would like cry for the TV to be switched off and say, read, read, read. Really? Like, I was like, I, I hated TV and I loved I loved reading. Um, so I used to obviously read a lot. And you read about re people turning to religion and stuff like that. Wasn't in my head. Wasn't like, don't, I mean, I wasn't thinking about religion as such. Maybe I was asking some religious questions. As in, I might have been asking about like, why are we here? And what's the plan for the universe and things like that. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't looking for religion at that time. Uh, I changed school because uh, we went through middle school, like primary, middle, high. So middle school finished in year eight and year nine, we went to high school, to a different school. Um, I went there in year nine and uh, I decided to sort of try a different, you know, move away from those guys because what they were doing was my friends were getting into worse and worse stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had a limit. I was all up for like, you know, rebelling and messing around, but there was some stuff that was just like getting too much right. so i decided like okay i'm gonna move away new school move away make new friends do something different that's what i did um year nine was a bit of a transitionary period i was kind of like between the two didn't quite know what i wanted to do i was, I was still see my old friends sometimes see some new friends sometimes have no friends sometimes like i did all, all of it you know the whole lot um and i think it was probably year 10 although it might have been the end of year nine it's difficult for me to figure out. i'm sure it was year 10 that I started taking religious education classes um, and we did a little bit about Islam. Okay. And I'm not going to say to you that the first time I heard about Islam, I just jumped up and said, I want to become a Muslim. Right. But I felt very strongly that Islam was the right, kind of had the right idea on that specific point. So for example, we did the concept of God. Okay. Right? They, they, this, is who, this is who God is. And you know that God in... Uh, in Christianity for most Christians now it's wrong to say for all Christians but for most Christians God in Christianity is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit right. um, there are Unitarian Christians who don't believe that but generally a lot of Christians believe that you know you've got the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit but that for me it was never my belief you know I was a Christian but it was never I never really uh, sub sub subscribed to that at all I kind of sat there thinking well you know I'm not sure I don't think that that's that doesn't make sense to me like I believed in God, but I just didn't, I didn't subscribe to that belief. It just didn't make any, I couldn't understand it. And don't get me wrong, I, I understand that there are things about God you can't understand. Don't I, like, I, I get that. Like there are things about God you just can't, you can't understand. But what I couldn't do is I couldn't, I couldn't put it into a, like I couldn't understand it in the context of religion at all. It just didn't make any sense at all. So I, 
you know, I kind of wasn't looking for something else. I just was kind of skeptical about that particular part of the uh, belief in, in Christianity. And when I got told that Muslims believe one God, worship him alone, you know, separate from his creation, I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. You know, that's the God that I believe in. I mean, didn't say I want to become a Muslim. I just right, thought right. that's like, that's, you know, that's what I believe in. That is one God. You know, one God, worship him alone, makes sense. Then, you know, after that, I kind of went through the classes and I think a realization struck me after a few weeks. I started thinking, you know what it is? I, th I'm, I'm, you know, I, first of all, I started to notice that I was preempting that I would like Islam. Like, in other words, I would come into the class thing, I wait to hear what Islam says because Islam's definitely going to say the right thing. And that kind of struck me when that time happened. And I, we went through things like punishments, prayers, um, you know, the Quran, whatever. We went through like scripture, like we went through like, a, a, like just a factually, I mean, teacher was not a Muslim. Uh, we just went through factually about Islam. And I just start thinking, wow, you know, like, it's getting to the point where I really agree with everything that is being said. And that kind of made me think like, what does that make me? Does that make me a Muslim? Because right. I, does, am, I, am I like a Muslim now? Because I believe in those things. So I thought, well, I need research. So I went home. I opened up, uh, it wasn't Google at that time. It was like maybe, I don't know. Uh, Ask Jeeves? Uh, yeah, or Alta Vista or something oh, like that. I don't even know what that is. Like, <laughs> something like... <laughs> this is past yeah, my time now. Uh, I, remember ask, I remember Ask Jeeves and I remember... Um, yeah, it, it, Ask Jeeves was, the, I think, the first uh, uh, search engine that we came across. Yeah. Very my time. So um, I, uh, I went on, I typed in some stuff about Islam and obviously what comes up is just a mix of everything. Right. Some good things, some bad things. And I just took my time. I did my research and some stuff I found I didn't like but then I researched it and found that actually the way I understood it wasn't quite right. So I did some research. Uh, I found stuff I liked. I found stuff I didn't like. Uh, but to be honest, I kind of, with the stuff I didn't like, I did my research and I found that actually it's not, you know, it, it wasn't true. It wasn't as I understood it. And that's interesting because a that happens to a lot of non-Muslims is that they think something bad about Islam. They say, you know, well, I would agree with Islam if it wasn't for the way that Islam treat women, for example. And then you actually look into it and you realize that, well, a Muslim might, might mistreat a woman, but Islam doesn't, doesn't mistreat women. Right. Right? Islam doesn't call for mistreating women at all. You know? uh, or I would, you know, I would become a Muslim if it wasn't for dot, dot, dot. And I, when I started researching, I realized all those ones that if it wasn't for all had a reasonable explanation. And at this point, I was like, okay. So you know, it seems to me like in the future, like maybe when I'm older, Islam would be the religion for me. Okay. Um, but I wasn't going to become a Muslim at 14. I was like, it's not going to happen. Uh, and then I, I tried and I just found it really hard to live like that. I found it hard to live. And I think that's a, you know, that's like a, um, a maxim of life almost that you struggle to live if you are a different person on the inside to, 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 to on the outside. It's really hard to live like that. Uh, you find it stressful. You're always worried about keeping up appearances. You're, you know, saying one thing but believing one thing different. It's a very hard thing. You know, it's very hard for me to do. I, didn't, I, I found it a real struggle to do that. So I, you know, thought, look, I'm going to have to change my plan. I'm going to have to become a Muslim. And I went online again. I searched, how do I become a Muslim? And again, I found some misinformation. And some of the misinformation that I found is that you have to have two witnesses and it has to be a ceremony and it has to be... I think I'd heard that as well before. No. And that's the most ridiculous thing. I mean, can you imagine someone is like, you know, I don't know, he's, he's fallen off a cliff or something like that, you know what I mean? And, and he's like, you know, lying down all... And just on the moment of death, he says, you know what it is? I always wanted to become Muslim. That's, that's the right thing to do. Oh, but where are my two witnesses yeah. in the ceremony? Oh, well, never mind. I'll just die as a, a non-Muslim instead. Oh, yeah. You know, it's the most ridiculous thing. It has no proof for it. it. Not a single scholar of Islam has ever said this. This is just ordinary people just basically like talking about the religion stuff they don't know. Right. You know there's no genuine scholarly opinion that you have to have two witnesses and a ceremony for your Islam to be accepted. Uh, so I thought I would find a healer, like a like a loophole. Okay. So I went to my parents and I said, mom and dad, and they were like, kind of, yeah, yeah what? And I was like, uh, I just want to read something to you. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. 
I bear witness there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. But I read in Arabic only. Okay, fine. Only in Arabic. Uh, wait, how, did, how did you, let's ma- skip this bit. Only in Arabic. Did your parents have any idea beforehand that like you were looking into Islam or that like, you had interest? I don't really know. And I'll explain that in a minute okay. because I, I said this to them. They said, what is it? I said it was something in Arabic and I left. So for me, I'd become a Muslim, okay. but they had no idea. But my mom later said to me, and I think she said to me, probably a few weeks later, two, three weeks later, she said to me, have you become a Muslim? And I don't know why. I've never, you know, every time I give this interview, I put it in my mind to ask my mom why she said that. And I don't know if she saw me looking at something on the computer. I don't know if she checked my search history, just out of, you know, general teenage observation, you know, right. like what's yeah, he searching yeah, yeah, on the internet. Exactly. Um, and I don't know if she... Uh, observe me doing something I have no idea but all I know she said to me are you Muslim and I've, you know, I said like no what do you mean of course not Muslim that's ridiculous uh, you know like just because I've got a couple of Muslim friends now and you know like nah it's not it's, I'm not becoming Muslim uh, and she said oh okay and uh, you know a few weeks later I decided to tell her and I said to her mom you know when you said to me that I didn't become did I become a Muslim well actually I did and she just said we have to wait and talk to your dad. Now, in my family, like mom and dad, the dynamic is that mom makes all the decisions and dad, you know, like stays pretty quiet. <laughs> Defends them. Yeah. <laughs> like, he, yeah, he does. When he wants to, he'll make a decision. But he's like, he's he's quite quiet. And my right. mom is very vocal. Like she makes the decisions, you know. Right. And she wouldn't mind me saying that, you know, like that's that's how it is. You know, she, she makes the decisions often. And uh, my dad will make it when he's really passionate about something. But generally he's like, he's quite quiet easygoing person a gentle person uh, so we sat down me my mom my dad and it's like you know my mom's like saying what have you done why whatever and my dad's just quiet you know and then I remember my mom turned to my dad and she's like, she's like Peter do you not know that this your son has become a Muslim and you have nothing to say and he said well he seems quite you know convinced about it well in in, in, in those times because we're talking like pre-9-11 and, and pre kind of like Islamophobia becoming like at its peak what, yeah. what, what was the kind of idea of Muslims and Islam at that time there was still I mean first of all it's an idea that's foreign that's okay, the first fine. thing and the second thing is still there still was te- you know like that terrorism thing was still in oh, people's really? minds what year because was this you had oh, now, now you're asking I uh, I think it might have been it's difficult to say 97 okay. 97 90, okay. like uh, something like yeah, I think yeah, it's been I, I it's been was, about I twenty. Th- years. I was three years old. It's been about twenty years, but there was in that time there had been stuff going on around the world, okay. like in the name of Islam. There'd been uh, you know some stuff uh, um, going on, like in terms of world events and attacks and things, but like fairly low key, but still associated with Islam. So it's like the beginning of the kind of like this this sort of um, extremism surge and stuff like right. that. So that was a thing in people's minds and my mom had asked me about it and I'd said, look, I have nothing to do with that. That's not what I'm, you know, like mm. that's not what I'm about. Um, and I told her why. And I think her main concern was that I'd done it because of my friend, because of friends. Yeah. Because obviously I'd been someone who'd been very heavily influenced by my friends early on and they'd caused me to, you know, like run away and, you know, like do some stuff that I shouldn't have done. Uh, so obviously that made my mom kind of think, oh no, he's on another, like, man he's just like stepped it up a level he's gone from like really really bad friends to like changing his religion and becoming a muslim to like who knows what's he going to do next and i kind of explained to her that no it's this is something for me this is not something you know this is something i wanted to do nobody nobody gave me dawah nobody came and said to me you should become a muslim i just really that's what you know settled in my heart now don't get me wrong during the time i was researching islam i had gone out and found some Muslim friends and I had started to see things from them and that helped to encourage me but nobody had ever said to me like you you know you must become Muslim or something oh. like that so I became a Muslim and um, it was a bit difficult for first few years in terms of um, family were not a problem I mean my family basically said just don't talk to us about it keep it under wraps we advise you not to spread it to the world till you decide what you want to do you, you know, if that's what you want to do, do it. Right. But don't, don't, don't invite us to it. Don't tell. We don't want anything to do with it. But if that's what you want to do, we have no problem. And you're happy with kind of that. For as a 14 year old, I was happy. Right. Now I wouldn't have been. Right. Now I would have said no way. I would have said, you know, I'm gonna get, like. But in those days, I, I was like, I was young. I said, like, yeah, fine. You know, like that sounds good to me. 
لكم دينكم ولي دين you have your religion and I have mine yeah. but uh, I think the hardest thing was worrying about what people in school would say because I'm still a typical teenager right I'm worried about what people in school are going to say uh, I kept it fairly quiet but obviously you know once one or two people hear it's it's newsworthy right it spreads and people come to me and say and I deny it to some and, and I accept it to some and like you know there's all sorts of conflicting information like he's become this he's become that what is he doing Um, and uh, you know, it took me a, it took me a good couple of years to become probably until I got into sixth form to become really comfortable with being a Muslim and and praying with Muslims, uh, you know, openly. I remember we had a Juma in the school, uh, and I remember like that. You know, I, I used to run into the room where the Juma was held in the science lab and close all the curtains quickly, you know, oh, like so Allah. nobody would see me, you know, um, because I was just I just didn't want the like. I didn't want to start the whole thing, you know, like have pressure on me from people and stuff like that. Uh, and it's difficult. And that's why even now when I do new Muslim projects, I usually advise, I advise many new Muslims that take your time to announce your Islam. If you're okay. ready to do it from day one, no problem. You know, people in different situations. But if you feel like, you know, you're going to get a lot of pressure and a lot of kickback, just take your time to like, you know, to, to, to do that when you're ready. Because I was forced to answer questions about Islam that really I didn't know the answers to. You know, like my mom would come to me and say, oh, what about this? What about that? You know, what about this? Um, and I would kind of be like, uh, and I would try and half, give a half-baked answer, which is never a good idea. Right. You know, I always tell people now that, you know, if you, someone asks you something about Islam, you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know, and I'll find out for you. You know, even if they ask you something you should know the answer to. Someone says, I found a contradiction in the Quran on page this, page that, and what do you think about it? Just say, I don't know. Right. You so know, like, scholars used to run away physically, didn't they? From yeah, the just say, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, just say, I don't know. Like, just say, like, I'm sure there is a, a very reasonable answer And I will find out for you and get back to you. But don't give a half-baked answer and then they come back and say, I've proven your answer right, now right, what right, you say. Right, right. Or now I have a different answer. You know, it, it doesn't, it it doesn't, doesn't work. Do justice to the it, no, it doesn't work. So that was, that was kind of some of the things I struggled with when I was becoming Muslim. And that's the story of how I, how I ended up Muslim at 14. <laughs> okay, so let's skip forward a few years now. And you're in your late teens. You have decided to start kind of take your deen more seriously uh, and start practicing to, uh, to, to kind of a further degree. And you're now interested in studying at the Islamic University of Medina. I know there's a lot that goes before that and, and that kind of stuff, but like we mentioned before, your, your, your entire story is, on, is online for people who would like to listen to it. And something about your story of going to Islamic University of Medina really hit me hard. And I think it's something that a lot of the listeners could benefit from. And it's what... Sheikh Mohammed Saleh, I believe that that's um, who the Sheikh was, had said to you when you originally went to him to ask for your tazkiyah. And what he had said, do you, remember, do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I remember. And, and what he had said to you is something that re when, you, when I heard you say it in the video, it really, really hit me like a train. And I thought, subhanAllah, I feel like this is something that every single person right now in the uk who is um a person who you know, sometimes thinks about studying abroad or or not even studying abroad, but sometimes you know thinks about increasing their knowledge or uh, there's a lot of us brothers a lot of young brothers in the uk who just want to kind of just go to egypt for a year to study arabic and come back even that and what sheikh Mohammed saleh said to you really hit me hard and so I, i'd love it if you kind of go into that so 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 let's give some context so You're now kind of looking to actively go to the Islamic University of Medina. What you need is you need a reference. And so you go to kind of one of the um, shaykh that you know, or that is in, that is in your kind of, um, who comes down, who comes down yeah. on a yearly basis. He used to come down on a yearly basis to Newcastle, yeah. Right. And um, as you approach him and you, you basically say, I need a tazkia, can you provide it for me? Yeah. Uh, I obviously approached him through a translator. Okay. Uh, I realized I needed one. And um, he asked a few questions. You know, you kind of when you look at the translator, you're kind of expecting him just to nod his head and say, you know, like, yeah, you know, he says, inshallah, no problem. <laughs> uh, and I noticed there was like all sorts of like there was a frown and there was some like, you know, like long sentence came out. And I'm thinking, okay, this is not what I was like expecting. And the question came back that, um, do you know any Arabic? Uh, because obviously Sheikh's thinking, why is he asking through a translator? And I'm like, no, I don't know any Arabic. Is it like, 
So if he might, I can't remember if he asked me, have you studied? But he asked me like, you know, kind of asked me some questions. And I basically gave negative answers that, you know, I don't know any Arabic. I've just, you know, done whatever's in my local masjid. And, you know, like that's about it. You know, like I haven't done any major study or anything like that. Uh, and he basically said to me that if you're not able to learn Arabic and to study Islam when you are here in your own city with your family around you and with your comforts around you, then what makes you think you're going to be able to go thousands of miles and study Islam there? SubhanAllah, which is it, it's, it, it's, it's so crazy because when you say it, it makes so much sense. But originally, as you think to yourself, you know what? Um, if I take myself away from my family and take myself away from everything and just go and study the deen, that would be better for me. But when you put it like that, it makes so much sense because actually we have all of the comfort right now. So if we're ever going to study, I suppose we'll make a bit of effort. It would be when we don't have other things that are putting strain on our lives, like yeah. missing our family or being away from comfort. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, yes, no doubt going abroad removes distractions, but it brings new distractions also. And new problems, being away from home, being in a country that you're not comfortable with, where maybe the, the, the climate is not what you're used to and all of these different things. So I, you know, like I didn't appreciate his advice in the beginning. I thought he was just being awkward and I was kind of a bit annoyed with him that, look, you know, I'm a new Muslim and I came for a reference. And, you know, why are you like, but wallah, what he said was so true. And it wasn't just true. It was like, that's how people studied Islam in the past. They would study Islam until in their city until there was nothing left in their city they didn't know. And then they would move and they would travel city by city. But they, what they wouldn't do is just like say, oh, well, you know, I, like, there's nothing much in my city. You know, like, ooh, yeah, no point. I may as well go somewhere else. You know, they would study like that. And I didn't appreciate it till I went to Medina and I saw the state of the students. And I realized that those students who had developed a study habit you know, and it's, it, his, his answer is as much about a study habit as it is about actual knowledge. It's not that he's saying, why haven't you learned Arabic? And I say, well, Sheikh, I've got an Arabic teacher, but he doesn't know Arabic so well. And I'm, I've only been able, like that would have been acceptable. But it's the fact that you haven't developed any study habits. You haven't developed the ability to actually study, commit yourself to it. Like you haven't, you haven't actually even thought about like committing things to memory and writing things down and making notes and working hard and coming regularly for classes that you're supposed to come to. You know, if you can't come regularly to a class once a week, once a week in your home city where you've got your car, you've got everything and you can't come to that class once a week and then you're going to attend six hours a day in, uh, you know, in a foreign country with no car, no climate, you, you know, jumping on public transport, you're, you know, struggling to get by, you don't speak the language. It's no doubt that you have to develop, first of all, the study habit and then enough information that it makes your trip abroad more fruitful. So initially, you, you know, your trip abroad isn't, you see what happened with me when I went to Medina and people say, oh, you went to Medina and you learned and now you teach. But the reality is the level of my knowledge is very, very poor. And the reason it's so poor is that I went to Medina with nothing. And so I spent six and a half years learning and I got something. But Imagine if a person goes to Medina with something and then he spends six and a half years. Mm. So now what does he come out with? Something else. Mm. Yeah. A level of knowledge which is much, much, much greater and much more strong because and we used to see students from Yemen and students from Nigeria and students, you know, and even some students from the UK. And one of the things I used to see from them is that those guys, they were at a different level to us, even though they were sat next to us in class because they had studied these things at least in a preliminary way before, so it, not everything was new to them. So that's why I say to people, you know, if you go to Medina and you've studied 10, 20 Islamic books before you go, and you've learned at least a, a little bit, even if you just learned vocabulary, you've learned a bit of Arabic, you know, and you've tried and you've exhausted the resources that you have, then you go there, you know, it's a different different situation. Now you're like, you're, you're set to really, you know, increase your level to something which is is going to be you know of great benefit to the muslims um whereas i felt you know kind of in medina that i was i honestly felt i was playing catch up like i felt mm -hmm. like i'm especially i went to the faculty of hadith which is supposed to be one of the sort of academically stronger faculties i'm sure it's quite true but i mean at least it, it, the students who go there tend to be students who are pretty serious about studying and learning you know they're not like they're, they're not just students who who are kind of there just to kind of 
sail through the course. Right. They're, you know, they're, they're like, they're the hardcore, you know, students who really want to study. Uh, and I found like, you know, I'm in a class with people who, for me, they look like scholars to me. <laughs> These right. guys are my classmates and they look like scholars to me. Right. Like, so how am I supposed to catch up? And you spend your whole time, and, it, and it's a good exercise because surrounding yourself with people who are better than you is an amazing, in fact, as a piece of advice I would offer to everyone. Uh, surround yourself with people who are of a higher caliber than you are because otherwise you have nothing to aim for. You know, you're like, okay, I'm the most practicing, right. the most knowledgeable of my friends. Okay, what is there like to drive me after that? Unless I'm really self-motivated, you know, but having people around you who are better, it's like, I want to do what he does. I want to, you know, d emulate that. I want to be better than that. I want to learn more. I, and that's what motivates you. So I would always recommend people whether you're starting to practice, whether you've been practicing a long time, is look at who your friends are and at least one or two of them surround yourself with people who are like in a league above you and it pushes you up into that league, you know, like as best you can. So, right, so, so let's cut a long story short. In the end, alhamdulillah, you, you, you took that advice on board and... Um, I, I'm not sure I did. I, I, I didn't probably take it on board until I actually went there. I actually went to Medina and asked him again while I was and said to him, Sheikh, I'm in Medina now with an application form. I'm ready to go to the university. Will you give me a reference or not? And he said, yeah, no problem. But he, because he saw the effort you went to to an extent, right? To go to Medina, I right. think. That's, he okay, didn't see fine. me like study Arabic fine, or anything. Fine. He just saw me like that look, you know, he's, he's gone, to, he's come to Medina. And, you know, it's interesting because the Sheikh had a lot of fiqh in his answer, a lot of wisdom and a lot of understanding okay. that when I was in England and I could change, I had an option he gave me advice and he pushed me away. Right. But when I was in Medina and it became like an emergency situation, like you, you have to either give it or not, he gave it. So, uh, because he That's understood beautiful. that yeah, the situation yeah. was different. So this is like uh, understanding, uh, having understanding and wisdom of the context of a question. That the same person may ask you a question in Islam, t same question, and the same person may ask you the same, exact same question. And because he asks it in a different context or a different circumstance you answer him in uh, a completely different way what i wanted to go into is your <laughs> hmm, okay you go you had so many issues like uh not issues but you there was a lot of challenges in your path when you went to study at medina and um a lot a lot the, a lot of them were big challenges some of them were small challenges but you, in the end, Alhamdulillah, you ended up studying in Medina. My question to you is, at what point does a person say, I've tied my camel and it's not for me? Because if a, if a person praises istikhara and he, he makes effort towards something, there's challenges, there's challenges, there's challenges. Where's the, where's the line in saying, do you know what, this is my qadr? Or... You know, keep trying to pass through, keep trying to pass through, keep trying to pass through. Because in your case, for example, it was meant to be, and and you know, you keep you kept persevering. But is there not an argument that why aren't you accepting your other kind of thing? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Where, 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 when, do, when? At what mm. point do you say I've tried my camel? Okay, so with regard to qadr, is that using qadr as an excuse must always be for something in the past. Okay. You must never use qadr as an excuse for something present or something in the future okay. that doesn't mean it's not in part of qadr it is but it's not an excuse so you don't say about something coming up next week or oh, it's not my qadr to get it okay, okay yeah you say in the past it wasn't my qadr to get in this year it wasn't my qadr to memorize this ayah today because that's in the past but not something you're doing right now you don't use al ihtijaj bil qadr you need to use qadr as a dalil unless it's something in the past that you had did, you had done everything in your ability. And that's because Qadr is something that happens, you can't avoid it. Okay. But you have, you, the way you respond to what Allah decrees for you determines your reward. So for example, Allah has decreed a calamity for you. Yeah, That in itself is not connected to you. But what is connected to you is how you respond to that calamity. Okay. And how you change and how you, you know, what you decide to do. And that's why it's a, it's a, you know, it's a side point of benefit is that one of the scholars said, what's the difference between someone who is being punished and someone who's being forgiven for, by, through a calamity? 
So two people have the same event. They both get cancer. One of them is being punished and one of them is being forgiven. What's the difference? How do you know? Very simple. You know by the reaction of the person. If they get closer to Allah. If that it's making them closer to Allah, then they're being forgiven. And if it's making them further away from Allah, then this is nearer to being, we don't, we don't make like, we don't say for certain, but it's, right. it's nearer to being a punishment from Allah That's subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's really important that, you know, we react to things, uh, in, it, 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 we react to Qadr in the right way, which is that the more you learn about Qadr, the more inspiration you should have to work. And this is how you know if you understand Qadr properly. Like someone might say, like, Qadr is a tough topic, yeah? Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah, said, it's a sea that has no end to it. If you don't mm. climb upon the ship of the sunnah, you'll be drowned. Or words to that effect. I mean, if you, if you imagine this, like, it's a tough topic. But the way you know you've understood it properly is really simple. If you learn about Qadr and your motivation is to work really, really hard and beg Allah to save you, you've done it. Okay. If your reaction is, oh, there's no point in doing that now. Uh, no point. May as well give up. Never mind. Then you know you haven't understood Qadr properly. Right. And you have a misunderstanding in that topic. So this is just for all the you know all the Muslims listening and and you know thinking like it's a tough topic. It is a tough topic. Um, I've got a video on it, but it's it's a tough topic. But if you've understood it right, you just should feel super motivated to work. Like you should just feel like I want to just keep going and going and going and going, because if you're trying really hard for something, also, and it's another like sort of a side point. It's not the only reason, but if you're trying really hard for something, first of all, the Prophet ﷺ said that everyone will be made easy what he was created for, be made easy for him what he was created for. So you, if you're work, working really hard, then Allah is going to make it easy for you to achieve what you want. And if you're lazy, Allah is going to decree for it to be difficult for you to get what you want. If that makes sense. And Allah says, Allah gives an increase in guidance to those who are guided. Says, and I, if you understand it, the problems of Qadr go away. Like if you work hard for guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you. And if you really want it and you really strive for it and work for it and, and you know, bust a gut to be able to get it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to you. But if you're lazy and sit back and say, you know, if I, if only and if only, you know, then in that case, you have nobody to blame except yourself. Uh, and also the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who strive in our ways, uh, we will guide them to our ways and those who strive for us. Those people who work really hard For our sake We're going to guide them to the right way And part of Qadr is feeling a desperate need of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Okay. You feel like You feel like You know what it is There's no way I'm going to get to Jannah No matter how many good deeds I do Unless Allah guides me mm -hmm. So now I feel humility And I feel submission And that's You know people say Why did Allah make Qadr Something we have to believe in like why? why? Why has Allah made Qadr something that we as Muslims have to believe in? It has so many benefits. One of them is it lowers you in the sight, it, you know, in front of Allah. You submit yourself to Allah because you feel like, you know what it is, there's no way that I'm even going to get even within a hand span of Jannah unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes me there. So I need him. I need to make dua to him. I need to do what he tells me to do. I need to strive for him so that I can get there. Because just purely just working for myself is not going to get me there. And that's the first thing. But also it tells you that Allah is infinitely just and fair. And if someone really wants something and is really working for it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them what is best for them. And you know, you could say like if there was no qadr, uh, you work for something, you get it, but it might not be good for you. Like, you're like, I really want this job. I really want this. I really want to study in Medina. And you go for it and go for it and go for it. You study in Medina. You graduate and you turn out misguiding other people. It wasn't good for you. Right. But instead, Qadr is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah says, nah, I'm not going to give it to you because I know it's not the right thing for you right now. I might give it to you later. I might give you something better instead. But I know it's not right for you right now. I say, and it's a beautiful thing. So come back to your question. There's a few different ways to look at this, uh, this issue. One thing is, if the thing itself that you're striving for is good for you, then don't stop striving for something good. Especially if it's something Allah has made obligatory for you or Allah has told you that you should do. Don't stop striving for something good. 
You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you to, if someone said, I'm struggling to pray five times a day, should I just stop? No, you have to pray five times a day. You just keep on struggling, keep on striving, keep on working. That's the first thing. The second thing is don't confuse the objective and the means. So my objective is what? To learn Islam. My, my means of doing so is to go to Medina. Allah Azza wa may block a certain means for me and open another one. But the objective doesn't change. So someone may say like, you know, like I haven't been able to go to Medina, I'm not going to study Islam. But that's confusing the means and the objective. If your means is to study Islam, if your objective is to study Islam, the means are available all over the world. Different means, different places, different institutes, different online, offline, with a teacher, without a teacher. Studying Islam has not been closed for anybody. You know, the door is open for everyone. But the question is, is this particular means maybe not good for me? And going to Medina itself may not be good for me. But maybe going to Mecca would be good for me. Maybe going to Medina would not be good for me, but studying online right now would be good for me. And then going later, you know, at the end of the day, like if you have a good goal, don't confuse the goal with how you get there. How you get there might change, but the goal should be the same to, to, to learn. I mean, what is your goal for seeking knowledge? Like Imam Ahmed said, That you intend to remove ignorance from yourself and others. So if that's my goal, I'm willing for Allah to guide me to whichever way is best for me to achieve that goal. It's the goal that I want. And that's why it's not generally, and so it's okay to make dua for Allah for, for, for certain means, but it's better generally to ask for the objective. So to say, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Rather than saying, uh, Oh Allah, allow me to get into this class in this year, at this time, even though that's okay too. Because that may not be the best thing for you, but the knowledge is definitely good for you. So whichever way Allah makes it easy for you. So I think that's a, that's how I would respond to that question. JazakAllah Khair, Sheikh. So if, for example, there are, I mean, a, per a person who is uh, trying to increase himself in knowledge, trying to study the deen, or, or trying to be a productive person in general, if we just put, let, if we put this kind of um, topic at being a productive person in general, what would you recommend is the um, daily routine of a person who wants to a be productive or b um, you know be uh, study the deen, and then kind of the second part of this question is what is the daily routine of Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble? Okay, because <laughs> a lot of people I'm sure want to emulate. I know we just spoke uh, before we kind of went on air about. It, I mean, it's currently um, it's it's, it's it was we started recording podcast past um, Fajr time, um, and so you were saying that generally you stay up after yeah. Fajr. Okay, I'll try and answer the question. I think first of all, with regard to to productivity, I think there are two essential things. There are probably more, but there are two really essential things. And actually, it's a beautiful hadith, which is I think it is the hadith of productivity. Is that the Prophet Sallallahu said uh, in his hadith, "Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk, wasta'im billah, wa la ta'jiz." This is, that's productivity. There is no better statement of how to be productive than that. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Work hard for what's going to bring you benefit. In the dunya or the akhirah. Wasta'im billah. And seek Allah's help for it. Because if it's not for Allah's help, you're not going to achieve it. You can work 24 hours a day and achieve nothing. You can work half an hour a day and achieve everything that you hope for. If Allah helps you. Work for what's going to benefit you. And that tells you it's from you. That's not like, I'm going to sit down and wait for Allah to make me a scholar. I'm going to sit down and wait for Allah to make me a millionaire. I'm gonna, no, I'm going to work for what's going to benefit me. I'm going to work hard for it. But at the same time, I'm going to realize I'm not going to get it without Allah. I'm going to seek help from Allah. And don't be defeatist. Don't say, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. And don't be defeatist. And don't say in the end of the hadith, and don't say, if I only did this, if I only did this, it would have been like this. If I only did this, it would have been like this. Because the if opens the door, or if only opens the door to the work of the shaitan. What a hadith. I love this hadith. This is amazing. This is the, this is the hadith of productivity. Go and look for what's going to benefit you. Whether it's in the dunya or the akhirah, just just go out and look for what's beneficial, what's going to help you, what's whether it's what you eat, whether it's what you do, whether it's your job, whether it's your skills, whether it's training, whether it's learning, whatever it is, you go and look for what's going to benefit you. 
whether it's your, you know, your religious stuff, your prayers, your, go and look for what's going to benefit you and seek the help of Allah to achieve it. And don't be defeatist. I don't say, you know, like, oh, I'm never going to do it. I'll never be able to do it because that's actually a negative about Allah Azza wa Jal. Because it's Allah who can guide you to do it. So when you start saying, I'm never going to do it, I'll never be able to, I don't think it's not going to happen. Why? How? Like, you know, that you're kind of almost, it's almost like you're saying that Allah can't give it to you. Right. You don't know, like believe in yourself with the help of Allah. And don't say about something, if only I did this, I would have done that. Oh, if only last week I'd done this, I, I, I could have done this. If only I'd done this, I could have done this. Because that's in the, in the past. Yeah, and when you start questioning the past and saying if only that goes against the issue of qadr completely, because it opens the door to the shaitan. This if only, or if only I'd done this, it would have done that. If only I could have been here, I would have done that. No, don't don't look at that. Look towards the future, and that's that for me is is just that's productivity, you know. Um, and look at what Islam gives you, because Islam wants you to be productive. In Allah, you hibbul muhsinin. Allah loves the muhsinin, and one of the meanings of muhsin or hisan is a person who excels and they they exceed expectations. They are more productive than you would have expected them to be and they're just exceeding the levels. And Allah loves the people who do that. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ الْإِحْسَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah has written excellence for everything. You know, you got to try strive for excellence in everything. So there are hadith. So I'll talk to you about, you know, sort of um, what the ideal routine would be. Um, what I aspire to, I'm not sure how many times I do it, but certainly what I like, I would aspire to. I think that um, the routine of a Muslim, first of all, how important sleep is. You know, sleep, I looked at my life and realized the main thing that was preventing me from achieving my goals was probably sleep. Okay. Um, because at the end of the day, that's the big, that's the majority of your life. Like, I mean, it's like, in terms of if you look at all the activities, the one that has the big chunk versus anything else is sleep. And there's definitely this kind of um, um, nav- narrative in pop culture and in, in kind of mainstream media that like, um, or like motivational Instagram posts of oh, sleep is for the weak or I'll sleep when I'm dead. But sleep is very important. It's important to get good quality sleep, but it's also important not to have too much. Right. Because too much of it is just gonna, you know, it, 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 you need it to become, you know, to be productive, to be sharp. Um, you need it to to be able to for your body to be able to recover for you to be healthy, um, but at the same time, you also if you have too much of it, it just kills your day. It kills your day, and you all know we've done the like you know the ten hours sleep or whatever, and you wake up and your whole day is yeah. just dead. You know, it kills your day. So it's important, and the scholars generally say six hours to eight hours is is good. Okay. So you're aiming for six hours, seven hours, something like that. Now the thing is that ideally, as a Muslim, you want to get up for tahajjud. And in terms of tips for getting up for tahajjud, and I'm not going to say that I'm a brilliant person for getting up for tahajjud, but the tips for it are start with something easy. Start with 15 minutes before fajr. Okay. 15 minutes, that's it. Ten, 10 minutes before fajr. Go make wudu, pray two rakat. That's it. Nothing else. You pray your witr before you go to sleep as usual because you're not going to break that routine till you get used to it. Then you can start praying witr at the end. Okay. But like, just pray witr before you go to sleep. Wake up 15 minutes before fajr. Go make wudu, pray two rakat. That's your, you know the start of your tahajjud, yani. and then slowly expand it. You know, get half an hour. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, well, I say openly. I'm not a one who's praying any a third of the night or a half of the night or something like that. You know, I'm a person who maybe I don't know. Like you know, if I can do it, it's great. You know, but like that's the aim. Is the aim is to to have that uh, that uh, to get that tahajjud praying because that's the time when your dua is accepted. So all the things you want to achieve in the day, like you know, you want to make dua for them at that time. Uh, and even if it's only even if it's only two quick raka, because once you pray that two quick raka, you get a, you get a feeling in yourself. You start thinking, man, that prayer wasn't long enough, man. That prayer wasn't like you know. I only got to pray like kulhu Allahu ahad. Like I wanted to like really lengthen it because I wanted my du'a to be accepted, you know. So you start thinking, oh, maybe I'll set my alarm fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, and you know you work up from there. Uh, go and pray fajr in the masjid for the men. For the women in the earliest possible time okay. uh, But go and pray Fajr in the masjid Get out of the house Get out your pajamas Because it's not sunnah to pray Fajr in your pajamas yani, like, Or your sleeping clothes The sunnah is you get yourself ready You know, if you need to take a cold shower You know, I'm all for ice baths and cold showers And things right. like that Yeah man, I'm like definitely Really? Definitely yes. 
like uh, it's a, it's it benefits you in so many ways. But you know, even if it's not like do freezing daily? cold shower, I don't. But okay. even if it's not freezing cold shower, but even if it's just cold, okay. And you can put a little bit of hot on at the end if you're feeling really like you know. But it like you get yourself up, you're awake, you're ready. You go to the masjid and you and try to sit in the masjid until sunrise. Okay. I don't do that every day, but whenever you can do it, it it's a benefit. You know, like to try. As I said, this is more the routine I aspire to than the routine that I have because. A person doesn't want to really say, you know, I do this, I do that, when I might do it a day and miss five days, you know. But the routine I aspire to is you sit in the masjid uh, until Fajr, reading Quran, remembering Allah. Because you know what it is? Very, very rarely does anyone have work at that time. Fine, yeah. Yeah? yeah. That's a time when you have time to just give it to Allah. And just read Quran, switch your mind off from work, from the dunya. The dunya doesn't stop. You know, if you're running a business, the world doesn't stop. You know, like things are just going all the time. The same problems will be there when you leave the masjid as when you came in. So just go and sit and read your Quran, pray two rakah after sunrise. Now be careful, the time for sunrise is not the time you pray. You pray 15 minutes after the time for sunrise on your prayer timetable or your app. So you pray 15 minutes after that. Wait 15 minutes, pray. So it's usually about an hour. Is that to make sure that it's completely that it's risen? R- it's risen uh, to the height of a spear okay. because otherwise it's prohibited to pray in that time. So you pray and you know that for me, when I do the days I do that, bro, I just like you feel like a different person. If that's you, your morning routine, you're going to have you, barakah in your day. You come out like, and, and there's a hadith which some of the scholars said it's a fair hadith which the Prophet ﷺ said that the barakah for my ummah has been put in the early morning. Burika fi ummati fi bukuriha. The barakah for my ummah has been put in the early morning. So uh, at this point, I would come back home and I would have probably one of three different things to do. Um, if I could get a bit of exercise in, great. If I can't, you know, I won't. I don't, I don't, I'm not a person to spend an hour at the gym a day. Okay. Because for me, uh, like, you know, I have like some strong opinions about that. I think it's a waste of time. And unless you're like going for like some sort of competition or something like that. Any couple hours a week is more than enough okay. more to, to get the changes and the benefits you want. Any. Okay, I know it helps to de-stress you and stuff like that. Like, but you know, I'm, I, I don't have an hour to waste in the gym every day. Okay. Um, but like every, you know, the odd day might do half an hour here, half an hour there. You know, come back myself ready, and then I've got kind of two things to do. Generally, sorry, gym wise, generally are you hitting weights, are you cardio? Weights, okay. weights, bro. Not, not that I look like it, but you know, like no, it's, uh, work us. it's uh, <laughs> weights for losing weight, Yanni. Okay, fine. like because uh, like the cardio thing again, for me, it just takes too long. Okay, you know, <laughs> like I'm gonna run for an hour and lose a Mars bar. You know, like right, that's yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yanni gonna. It's just a big waste okay, of my time, fine, Yanni. Fine. Like. I would rather like lift some heavy weights and you know l- like in 10 minutes I can lose that Mars bar right, you know right, like right, so right, right. it's that kind of thing you know okay. um, I, I tend to do it at home to be honest okay. um, uh, because uh, I find it's really hard to find a halal gym that doesn't have music and right. there's a good one downstairs but it's like you know still it's like you go in there and, and the first thing that happens is everyone wants to tell you what to do yeah, and, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Really Every, everyone has the annoying. everyone has the secret. It's so annoying, you know. Like, <laughs> just want to say, just and I'm a very like I'm not a, that much of a social, but okay. I'm just like, just like leave me alone. Fine, fine, fine. Um, so I tend to do it uh, in uh, at home, right. um, and I'm I mostly it's about losing weight because okay. I put on a lot of weight. Like if you look at my videos, you can see like uh, when I was in Medina, I was like pencil thin, and I graduated. And as I started to get towards the end of graduation, I got bigger and bigger. And by the time I was like a couple of years after graduation, I was like, people were coming and tapping me on the tummy. No and way. they were like, no they way. were like, I've not noticed that. They were I like, watched different videos. Nah, they were like, they were like, bro, you, mashallah, you've, got, <laughs> you've put on knowledge and your knowledge has gone <laughs> to your no, stomach. I was big and fat. And uh, so, you know, going to the gym to lose weight, not so much to bulk up, just, okay. to, just to lose weight and just to be generally, you know, fit. Um, like if that was one of the times I also sometimes I would go like for example like I said horse riding or diving or whatever that's usually early morning thing but generally I would come home and one of the things I would have one of two things either I have homeschooling with my kids because all my kids are homeschooled um, or I would have my own dawah projects I do at that time because I tend to go to work work at Kelima Uh, I tend to go about 10 o'clock every day um, roughly every day is different because some days I have classes at Fajr so I have have to reverse my routine and sit in the masjid there and then do the class but generally I mean I would I would go about 10 11 o'clock because I find that that work doesn't need as much it's not as creative and I try and do my most creative work 
first you know that tends to be go there answer emails do this you know do that like prepare class or whatever but the stuff that i'm really trying like my new projects and dow projects stuff that needs a lot of thinking i tend to do that early in the morning and obviously get my kids ready for the homeschooling i share that between me and my wife so like we i was gonna ask okay. like my wife tends to take the younger two the older one tends to be with me uh, and we'll just go over, you know, homeschooling work and stuff like that. Who, who gives you that? Um, do you, are you given like a, um, a what is it called, a, a curriculum or something? I follow British national curriculum, but I just adapt it to what I want my kids to do. So like, is we there had, any like? Sorry to interrupt. Is there any like r- rules or anything where you just can do it? Um, it you kind of make your own rules, but you have to fit into the system in the end. Okay. So in the end, they have to do an. So you, the the rule in the UK is you have to give your children an education. Okay. But it doesn't specify what kind. So you could you know teach your children woodwork, and that would be classed as giving them an education. You know, like you don't have to put them through GCSEs. You just have to give them an education. Uh, but. Me, I want my kids to do GCSEs because it's kind of accepted standard. It's important for, you know, later on in life. So I, at the end, my goal is that my kids should go and sit the GCSE exams as external candidates, um, you know, in a school in the UK. Uh, they just come for exam time. So to do that, I need to make sure that I'm relatively tracking, like as m- roughly tracking the national curriculum. So it's a different way. With the younger kids, what I tend to do is I just have some good websites that we go to and we print worksheets and we buy some, you know, small, like thin books and they do exercises and things. But with my older son now, as he's getting closer towards GCSE time, um, he's in year eight right now. Uh, I'm obviously like now I buy him the same textbooks they teach in schools okay. and we go through those textbooks. We, we go through, th- you know, practice questions and things like that. Um, but the nice thing about homeschooling is it works around you. You can be as flexible as, you know, and you can be, uh, you can do whatever you want. So I add in there Islamic studies, Quran, Arabic. I take stuff out of the national curriculum that I don't particularly want him to do. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask about that. Do you, would you recommend, especially for people in the UK now, would you, is that something that you'd recommend considering, um, I, my, um, sister-in-law just graduated as a teacher. And she was telling me about the stuff in the curriculum, and it's in, it's insane. Like so, uh, the, some of the stuff they have to teach, even primary schools now, mm. they have to teach in primary schools about um, uh, like sex education in detail, and they have to be fair with all of the uh, yeah. sexualities. And but that's not part of the examined curriculum. Right. Like you don't need to know that to set a GCSE. Sure. That's part of what they have to do in school, but it's not part of the examined curriculum. Like, so it's part of the guidelines that Offset give to schools. So as a homeschooler, you don't need to do it. So homeschooling is something you'd actively recommend? I, I think it's the, one of the best decisions, alhamdulillah, that I ever made for my kids. What if a parent isn't, like, as educated as yourself? Oh, I suppose no. you could choose as well. Yeah, no, you, you work around what you have. Fine. At the end of the day, you know, yeah, I, and, and, you know, people have the most, people have the biggest misconceptions about homeschooling. I'll just to tell you a couple. One thing people will say is no homeschooling kids are successful. We just got a message not long ago about a f- a sort of a friend of a friend who uh, has a child who's homeschooled who got accepted to Oxford or Cambridge University. I don't know. Like, this is totally, like, this is not, it's total rubbish that homeschooled kids are not, like, a lot academically successful because they do the same GCSEs as other kids do. They do the same A-levels as other kids do. And they have opportunities to go to the same universities as other kids do. So there's no reason why that child should not go to Cambridge or Yale or Harvard or whatever. You know, that's if that's what they want to do and if that's what their parents want them to do at the end of the day. Okay. Um, but on the other side, people will also say homeschool kids are socially underdeveloped. And this is the biggest pile of rubbish you will ever i mean this is just this is just i will use the i will use the way i'll go as far as to say this is battle this is just falsehood i can see you know i can see like, in your oldest like, like, he's very m- no so yeah. i like this is just total rubbish if you lock a kid in a room yeah they're socially undeveloped uh, but you know this idea of being underdeveloped you know what the kids don't go outside they yes, don't mix huh. with people they don't go to parks and play with other kids they don't go to you know, Islamic centers and Quran classes and whatever. You know, at the end of the day, they mix with other people. People come to the house, they go to other people's houses. It's complete rubbish to say that homeschooled kids are socially underdeveloped. And that's just said by people who basically have no idea what homeschooling is. 
um, or they've judged it on cases where there are other factors, like the kid hasn't been homeschooled, they've just been not sent to school. There's a difference, right, yeah. big difference. Homeschooled, you're giving your kids an active education. Just kept them at home, that's not, that's not homeschooling. That's just you know keeping your kids at home and not sending them to school. They may call it homeschooling, but that's not homeschooling. Uh, but one of the things I love about homeschooling is, and one of the things I'm so passionate about is a couple of things. Number one, Islamically, it's like the difference between the heavens and the earth. It's a massive difference because now you're in control of your kids' education, what they learn, what they don't. And you have a degree of control over their social interaction as well. Like you can kind of, you know, like you're not forced for them to be in a class with a bully who's beating them up right, or right, with right. a person who's telling them to smoke or take drugs or whatever. You have a, a more control over that. And they develop a much more mature and a much more, you know, sort of sensible sort of character, I think, you know, like depending on, you know, the kind of people you introduce them to, um, obviously kids their age and stuff, but, you you know, you're, you're not like putting them in that pot, which is, you know, school. And, you know, as, I mean, as you get older, you know, as you start going to high school, what are the kids in high sure. school doing? Yeah, you know, If you can save your kids from that, <laughs> yeah. well, lie, any you save them. Well, even if they end up ignorant and they end up just, you know, like on minimum wage at the lowest of the low doing like this most menial job, well, lies, and they go to Jannah, it's worth it. That, that's, that's I mean, that's one thing. Uh, but also what's great is building a relationship with your kids because you see your kids all, it's not like you send your kids to school and like pack my kids off and like someone else do the job. It's like, I know what my kids are studying. I know what they're going through. I know what they're feeling. I know the good things, uh, the bad things, the worries, the fit and the like, because you know, you're, you're like a part of it. You know, you're, you're a, you're an active part of it. Um, and so it builds a bond with your kids uh, and, and the kids love it as well because um, we try to give them everything they would have in school from trips to, um, saves you loads of money as well, <sighs> but from from trips to uh, like to like sort of uh, projects and things like that, the only thing that's a little difficult is working in groups, group work. Okay. Because obviously if you don't have more than one child at home who's homeschooled, it's a little, group work can be a little bit, you have to kind of work around it. Either go to a homeschooling group and do work with a few kids in a group or something like that. But I've I've not found it, and I've found academically, you know, like generally homeschooled kids academically, if they're well schooled, they're far you know far better than than kids in in regular schools as a general rule. I mean, obviously there are some really intelligent kids in in regular schools, but as a general rule, homeschooling you got one to one tuition, yeah. you know, like it's it's there's nothing to replace that. Uh, and also, as a parent, it, it gives you the motivation to learn as well. It's fine, that's um, very true. You know, like, and and I don't. I think up to GCSE, most people wouldn't struggle. At least at primary, almost n not no parent would struggle to teach their kids up to primary level. You know, almost no parent would struggle to teach their kids up to like year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, ten, eleven. If the parent is themselves, you know, has themselves done GCSEs and A levels, then they probably wouldn't struggle to teach you know from year 7 to 11 either and then by then you can think about sending your kids to a school doing part time doing distance learning like, there's a lot of options yes, right. a lot of things to think about and I'm not against schools either like I'm not in the sense that I would say never ever send your kid to school every Muslim parent must homeschool their child because it works for some people and some people it's difficult depending on both parents might work you know, so it's, it's difficult really. but I believe that homeschooling should play a much bigger role than 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 people you know maybe would would think that it should right. So you've completed your morning routine, you've homeschooled your children, inshallah. Off to work. Off to work. Right. Off to work. Um, and obviously we have here the big problem of Dubai Sharjah traffic. Okay. Um, but I d I deliberately go to work at that time to m to minimize the time that I spend in the car because if I went at eight o'clock I would spend like an hour in the okay, car. Fine. Right. And if I go at like 10 o'clock, I will only spend like half an hour in the car. Is there anything you do in the car to make sure your journey, because you seem like, you, as you've mentioned many times in this podcast, you're, you're very, pro, you don't want to waste any time. Do you do anything in your car that is productive while you're driving? Listen to anything? I or? mean, I should give a disclaimer that I probably waste loads of time, but right. I, and my aspiration is not to right. waste time. Uh, so in the car, uh, what I would do is, um, it depends. Uh, sometimes I would recite Quran. Okay. Um, like from memory just to you know just as a, uh, something to remember Allah Azza wa Jal listen to something beneficial uh, that could be uh, it could be Quran it could be a lecture it could be a podcast it could be 
you know, and, and just generally like, you know, just try and use the time, like try and feel like I didn't just sit there looking at cars and sure. then arrive at work, sure. you know, with whatever, with whatever is possible. So that's what I would do. Um, I get to work and, you know, my work is like, uh, you know, it's every, every day is firefighting, you know, like every day is like an emergency. <laughs> and by that, I mean that, you know, we, Dubai is a big, big place and I work, you know, my work is limited to Dubai really, um, as opposed to the other Emirates. Dubai is a big place and there, to the best of my knowledge, there is no other full-time English-speaking diet in Dubai. And that puts a huge amount of pressure. I mean, I'm dealing with things from kids who are turning to atheism. Um, and this is a this is like, you know, if any parent still thinks that, you know, just the fact that you brought your child up as a Muslim will keep them as a Muslim, uh, I would honestly, honestly say that, uh, you know, you, you're in a dangerous state of being unaware of what's going on. Yeah. Because the number of kids leaving Islam is just insane it is huge there are kids leaving islam i mean forget about islam being the fastest growing religion and he, I, honestly there's times when i think the fastest shrinking religion yani like there's there are there are people leaving islam just left right and center you know kids who are just coming 14 15 years old saying i don't want to be muslim anymore you know and this is in a muslim country let alone in you know in the uk and places like that where maybe they might keep the name but you know generally like there's a, it's it is a huge, huge problem. And so that is just like one tiny thing. I have my Rukia cases, my emails, I have my classes to prepare. Um, I have all the, you know, the fact that, and one of the things, if I if I could, I would never go to the office. Like this I thing, like I've tried to convince my, my work for ages, but they don't get, but if I could, I would never go to the office because I find it unproductive. Right. Like I go to the office and like someone comes and like wants to, you know, ask me something or not something beneficial. Like some people just come want to talk. Someone wants to come say, oh, do you know how to fix this on the phone or the computer's not working? Can you do this? Can you like it, that kind of stuff? Like, and I'm of not because you're educated in IT as well. Like, and I'm not. Yeah. Like I'm, I was an IT cop. I am an IT as I was, I don't know quite something to do with <laughs> being an IT consultant project manager. Uh, so, you know, like just generally the, the, the phone ringing, people shouting each other. Like if it was me, I would just like, you know, I would not, never come to the office unless it was for a, a specific reason, right. you know, like or I'd have my own like area. I had my own office. I, I don't now. I've, I've gone to open plan, but I had my own office in the last place we were at. But even still, it was still like just knock, knock, knock. Yeah. Or knock, 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 you know, knock, 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 knock. Someone phone wants to know, you know, like. It's it's so like for me I, to do that much work, I have to like be so strict on what I do, Fine. and that's why people might say, "Well, we got in touch with you. You didn't answer for three months." But I take my emails in queues, like I I put it in a queue and I answer them in in, in the order I receive them, unless I see it's an emergency with a capital E, you know, like. And for me, that like has a big mean. Like if I, someone says I'm about, I'm gonna leave Islam, or I'm I'm on top of a bridge, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna obviously reply to them right, right away. Right, 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 right. But if someone says, oh, you know, I feel really bad and I'm really depressed, they're gonna have to just wait wait in the queue right. for for the other people who are have the same problem who are before them. So answering all those. Um, do you feel Do you feel a lot of pressure with because of the idea that? Uh, being a da'i and being a person like a student of knowledge and, and someone, especially English speaking. There must be a lot of pressure put on you to just kind of essentially solve people's problems, whether that be I'm feeling upset, I'm feeling down, to being you know my marriage, I'm, I'm struggling with my marriage, I can't like I'm struggling when it comes to raising my kids, and is essentially people must put a lot of it. It must be bent. It must be very um, what's the word? Uh, people put burdens on you, right? Um, I feel it in two ways. I feel it mostly from the point of the amana. Like Allah said, in Allah murukum and to addul amanati ila ahliha. Allah commands you to fulfill the responsibilities and the trusts you've been given to those who've entrusted them to you. That's a, a tough ayah. Wallah, that's a hard ayah. Because people entrust things to me that wallahi I can't do. And I really believe, by the way, like one of the things I've really tried in the last couple of years is to learn to say no. You know, I really have tried with everything I can to learn to say no. And I believe that saying no is a fundamental part of fulfilling amanat. Like to fulfill a responsibility, you have to learn to say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. 
it's better than saying yes and not being able to deliver. Definitely. And and you earn so many sins by saying yes and then not delivering. It's so much better for you to say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And people get angry with you and they say, like, oh, you know, I came to you with an Islamic project and I wanted you to do something good. But it's far, far better for you to say, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And, you know, I, I've even read like books by non-Muslims or whatever on, you know, the, how to say no to people. I haven't been read. I've listened to summary podcasts about them and things like how to say no to people. Mm-hmm. I think it's an essential thing, but I'm still useless at it. I'm trying, you know, like I'm, I, but um, I, I like try to say to people, I try to set people. I think it's not about saying no. It's about setting people's expectations. So that might involve saying no. It might involve saying I only have half an hour for you. Or it might involve saying your email is in a queue and I will respond to it when I finish. That may take two or three months. Uh, but, you know, just, you know, that's setting people's expectations. So the, one of the things I find very difficult to deal with is the is uh, is actually social media and the new way of communicating because it's very instant. It's like someone sent you what? It's like, I sent you a WhatsApp message. You didn't reply. Uh, you, you did and so did, you know, and at that time, so like a uh, hundred other people. And he, so... But everyone gets angry, so that's why I don't really communicate much on social media. Okay. Just with I communicate with people who have um, like something to arrange, like a lecture to arrange, or we want to arrange this podcast or whatever. Right. That makes sense because it needs a kind of a conversation that's in like fairly quick, sure, you know, between sure. the people. But uh, I won't really answer questions via things like WhatsApp because it just becomes like one more question, one more question, one more question, one and more question. And you also have, you, you, uh, I you have your, your, your life, life, you have your whole yeah. family, the, your, your, your children, your wife have rights I mean, over you. Yeah, definitely. It's on my topic. I switch, I switch notifications off my, I think it's another thing I would advise everyone to do. Completely. Switch notifications, leave the little red dot or whatever, but switch notifications off banners, banner notifications okay. off your phone. Because you're just, you're working and it's just like, ding you're working doing next one sure. doing like, and it's just once you're on your phone you're in you know in an hour. it's just like you know doing what you know like so i try to have a queue of work i try to prioritize so when i come in on a monday i deal with things like communication because usually i have a big pile of emails because i don't answer anything friday saturday sunday because friday is the main day for lectures and saturday is the main day for workshops and classes and Sunday is the day that i have off so i spend it with the family okay. so i don't generally answer the phone at all friday saturday sunday and I'm notorious for this. You know, people people take my number, they get so happy. They're like, oh, I've got his number. I say, miskeen or lion. Like, that number, la yusmin wa la yusmin even ju. It's not going to, it's not going to, Yanni, like, it's not going to benefit you in any way because that number just rings and rings and rings. And That's I'm very blanking, inspiring. Yani. It's very inspiring because you, it, 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 saying no and, and, and knowing the rights of the people that around you, like, like the rights of your family, is, is very important. Um, I, I'm conscious of taking up too much of your time and therefore I, want, I do want to breeze for you a, f- a few things. I've got a list of um, topics that I would love to more so breathe, breathe through because we've um, I've already taken up quite a lot of time. Let's finish off your daily routine, first of all. Okay, <laughs> super quick. You come back from work. So work is all about, you know, I do do appointments with people. I do them individually. But when I, I, I make people go through a filtering process, so they send me like a, a request via the website to say they want an appointment, and I make them go through a filtering process. Okay. So I make them like, do you really need an appointment? Or can I just answer this to you by email? Because email, I can reuse stuff. I can cut and paste, right? Fine. Like I can, you know, I can send stuff... Um, uh, you know, so I kind of say like, do I, do they really need, but when they need, of course, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to give them. I'm going to try to be an approachable person. You know, people can come and see me. Um, and you know, I do th- all that stuff. I do my classes, whatever. And, you know, between the Salah, go to Salah, come back, whatever. And then I, you know, obviously I go home. I probably go home. It depends. Sometimes I manage to get home uh, before Maghrib, sometimes between Maghrib and Isha. Usually, if it's between Maghrib and Isha, that time will be again with the homeschooling. So it'll be about like just checking that the work's been done, marking, setting the goals for tomorrow, things like that. Um, sometimes a little bit of my own projects if they need it. And generally after Isha, uh, it's really just eat in bed, to be honest. Okay. Like, um, as mu- as, because you can't then do that if you sleep late. Like last night, I had a very, very late night because I had some stuff to do and I ended up getting back at like one thirty. So that kind of like it's ruined my like kind of routine for the f- uh, f- for the rest of the day. Are you a coffee man? Um, I can be. Okay. But it depends on the diet I'm on. Fine. Like, uh, um, but yeah, I can be. I can yeah. be. But I'm not like a person to drink like three, four cups a day or something like that. Like I might have a cup in the morning sometimes. Okay. But like I'm not, I'm not, not as much as when people major say they're addict. coffee. I'm yeah, not yeah, like yeah. a major addict. Yeah. So that's my, that's yeah, any kind of my routine. Obviously, Sunday is the Friday is very different, and Saturday because they're just classes, classes, classes all day. 
um, generally. And uh, obviously, uh, Sunday is the day off with the family and I try not to do any homeschooling on that day and not to do any work, any uh, like Islamic center work. But I do do some of my own work, which is my own dawah projects. And I just try and uh, spend time with uh, with family um, as much as possible because they also, it's a big amana, you know. And I, and I say this, you know, I'm saying this and I'm thinking, wow, if I could stick to this routine that I've just told you, I'd love it. You know, because, mm-hmm. you know, don't get me wrong, every, there are days where things just go completely wrong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm either working till really late or I'm back really, or I've just, you know, messed up my routine. There are days, you know. Or someone approaches you to do a yeah. two-hour podcast. <laughs> nah, it's no issues, man, no issues at all. Um, all right, so th- the next couple of questions are, 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 are slightly perhaps more like knowledge-based. Um, and feel free not to answer them. I mean, if that's what you, uh, you think suits best. Uh, one of them is about Adhkar. Um, uh, this is a debate I have, a, I have with a lot of people. Not a debate, more like um, it, it's something that people have different opinions on. Uh, one of them is, so you're mourning Adhkar, and nobody seems to have any issues with kind of you pray Fajr, you do your morning Adhkar. Uh, there seems to be a big difference of opinion between the uh, scholars on evening Adhkar. Some people say you do it between Asr and Maghrib, and some people say you do it after Maghrib. Mm. Um, is there kind of like a clarification you could give on that point? Yeah, I, I looked into this. Um, because I used to advise people to do a lot. I said, do your adhkar, do your adhkar. Um, and uh, what I found is that the opinion for after Maghrib is a minority opinion. Okay. And that actually almost everyone agrees you can do it after Asr. And the difference is, are you allowed to do it after Maghrib or not? Okay. I didn't find many people who held the opinion that you should do it after Maghrib. Like from among the scholars, and, and this is from limited research, I might be wrong. Um, and maybe if anyone gets in touch with you and tells you that I'm wrong, that would be great. You know, right. I'd love to know. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, I didn't find a main opinion that you should do it after Maghrib. I found only whether you can or whether the time finishes at Maghrib or not. And that surprised me because I actually believed it was do it after Maghrib. I used to tell everyone, yeah. after Maghrib, after Maghrib. But that was just me presuming that the night begins at Maghrib and stuff like that. So I was like, do it after Maghrib, do it after Maghrib. But when I looked into it, I found that the scholars pretty much all said, do it after Asr, and they differed, can you do it after Maghrib Fine, okay. or not? When so, you say do you after Asr, do you mean like straight after Asr yeah. or before Maghrib no, kicks in? So any, but okay, straight after right. Asr. Any, okay. Me, and, and I experienced with my Rukia patients as well, that I found that after Asr was a lot more beneficial. Okay, okay. So I changed to being like, I'm, I'm an after Asr person now. Okay, just after there that's may be beneficial. some adhkar that you do after Maghrib. Okay. Like, I'm, I'm still trying to find out this one where you read, uh, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd yuhi wa yumit wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Ten times, immediately after you finish the prayer, I thought this was that the wording of the hadith is Maghrib. Okay. And that this is done specifically at Maghrib as opposed to the other ones. But I would have to check all the different wordings to see if that's if there's not another wording that said, you know, just generally it has to be done in the afternoon or something like that. Um, but, you know, there are a few that maybe have to be done at Maghrib. But generally, uh, the adhkar as a whole, the ones where you do the evening adhkar, um, they don't have to ask her. And for those listening who uh, Just really quickly Those listening who um, Do uh, You know They do their f- um, uh, Salah five times a day And they say you know I do my salah five times a day And, and this is a source of protection for me um, I don't necessarily do my adhkar How important is the adhkar? It's extremely important And in fact From every point Not just protecting yourself It's not just about You know people sometimes talk Because I, I usually talk a lot about The jinn and rookie and things. Right. It's, not, it's not about that It's also just about protecting yourself from bad things happening to you during the day, preserving your ability to be productive, um, you know, being able to get the most out of your day. Uh, you know, if you just just go through Hisn al-Muslim, Fortress of the Muslim, and look at the virtue of each of those adhkar. Like one of them says, if you do this, no one will come to you on the day of judgment who is better except the one who does it more. If you do this, you'll be protected until the evening. If you do this, the shaitan will not come near you during the day. If you do this, uh, you'll get the reward of freeing a slave and you know a hundred good deeds and a hundred bad deeds and each one of them is like 10 seconds five seconds so imagine that the reward of doing them as a whole every day it's like it is like you're getting rewards for the whole day and just in that one little sitting okay final uh one on this kind of topic with regards to kind of the knowledge-based stuff 
is I, I, I remember watching one of your classes and you emphasized the point of obviously there's a big misconception especially I would say in the Pakistani community because I, that's kind of where I come from so that's what I know of it from of saying mashallah 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 when, when something happens um, or when you're trying to ensure that you don't get ayn on something and um, you mentioned in your class that um, it's better to say mashallah to barakallah and I I did a clarification on that though. Oh did you? I didn't watch the clarification yeah. Okay I did a clarification okay. That's actually also Partially wrong Okay um, I uh, First of all The Prophet Sallallahu Said in the hadith Seek baraka If you see something you like Or something you like from your brother Seek baraka For him Okay Now Tabarak Allah Doesn't really seek baraka for someone um, Tabarak Allah talks about How Allah is the source of blessings uh, but it doesn't really say bless him. Okay. So the the best way of doing it is to say, to 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 ask Allah to bless him. So there's lots of ways of doing that. So Allahumma barik. Okay. Allahumma barik lahu barak Allahu lak fihi barak Allahu lak uh, barak Allahu fiq. Anything where you're invoking baraka for the person. Okay. That's the best way. Okay. However, some of the scholars expanded it and said, whenever you remember that blessings come from Allah, that's enough. So saying MashaAllah is enough because you are simply remembering that blessings come from Allah. Okay. But definitely Al-Akmal, the more complete and the better way of doing things is to say uh, Allahumma barik Fine. or Allahumma barik lahu or barakallahu lak or barakallahu lak fi or you know, any of these sort of wordings. And I have some on my you know website uh, of sort of things you can say. But basically anything where you're invoking blessings. And if you don't know how to do that in Arabic, even in English, just to say, you know, may Allah bless you in it. You know, Allah bless you. May Allah bless you in it. That's what's important, is to invoke baraka for them. And some of the scholars said, Tabarak Allah doesn't invoke baraka for them. Okay. You, tabarak Allah tells you Allah is the source of blessings and that Allah is, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect and all of his attributes are perfect. That's Tabarak Allah. But it doesn't tell you that, oh Allah, send blessings upon this person, right. even if it is implied. And that's why other scholars said, it's enough to say, mashallah, Tabarak Allah, because you're implying you're remembering that blessings come from Allah and implying for Allah to send those blessings upon your brother. Because the essence of jealousy is not only to want something, that's to covet something. It's to want something and want the other person to lose it. That's the essence of jealousy. So it, jealousy is for me to desire something, but me to desire that other person to lose what they have. And that tells you that like that's a really that comes from a sick heart. Because, you know, like I might look at someone with a really beautiful car and I might say, you know, I might look at that person with who's got like a, a really, really beautiful car and I might say that, that, you know, oh, I wish I had that car. But to say I wish that person would lose that car and be poor and living on the streets and that I could drive the car instead of him, that takes a really, you know, <laughs> a really sad heart. And that's what jealousy is. Jealousy is nothing other than that. And that is what when Allah said وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ From the evil of the person who is jealous when they, when, they, when they envy. Because it's evil, you know, that it comes from a person, a desire for that person to lose it and for you to get it instead. As opposed to all just saying, oh Allah, give me a car like his or give me a car better than his. Right. It's like, oh Allah, let him lose it and let him suffer and let me get it instead. And that's like, you know, that's something, uh, you know, something... Which only comes from a really sick and evil heart. C can one say like Allahumma barik to oneself or about oneself? Yeah, you can say you can say um, uh, you can say Oh Allah bless me. Yeah, okay, um, and you know like you can uh, you can ask Allah Azza to to make you thank Him for the blessings. Rabbi awzani and ashkura ni'matik and all the you know the different things that you want to say. But yeah, you can say Allahumma sure. barik, especially because you, you sometimes can become impressed with yourself. And the scholars differ with regard to evil eye. As to whether you can give the evil eye out of amazement without jealousy. Okay. But I think the correct opinion is yes, you can. Right. In other words, you can give the evil eye without being jealous. You can give the evil eye out of being amazed. Like, wow, look at that. You can give the evil eye from sure. that. As opposed to, wow, look at that. I want him to lose it. Yeah. Like, so when you see something from yourself, you're impressed with, like, you can be like, you know, you could, you could look at yourself and think, wow, alhamdulillah. So you should at least say, alhamdulillah, yeah. or or oh Allah bless me, or oh Allah continue your blessings upon me, um, or you know, or oh Allah allow me to thank you for the blessings because when He thanks you, He's going to give you more. You know, but you you try to like not to be amazed at yourself, you know, and to just kind of uh, 
you know, to invoke blessings for everything and everyone, really. Sure. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. I would love to end the podcast by discussing a bit and asking a bit about the Humble Foundation. It's something that you set up. Um, what is it? How can people help towards it if people can help towards it? Uh, and what are your plans for it? Okay. So the Humble Foundation is my long-term project for what I want to do or what I want to contribute back to the community. And it's a registered charity now. Um, the website is so old that it's like totally outdated with what we're doing, but that's on my list of things to do. Allah must have. I'm, 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 I'm oh, working on not, it. You're, you're, you're I'm, I'm, I'm working on it in my own. It's not the website design that's the problem. It's the, oh, okay, co- it's the content. But like I'm working on it in my own time. But see, the Humble Foundation is something like I'm not rushed with it. It's, it's my long-term goal of what I what I want to give back to the to the community, inshallah. Um, and as a charity, you know, people open charities and, and, you know, people think like I would not open a charity for disaster recovery or poverty relief. And that's beautiful. But that wasn't my expertise. So the Humble Foundation is mostly, not completely, but mostly centered around educational projects um, and about open sourcing knowledge, like like getting this knowledge that is only with a few people and making it as easy for, for, for people to consume as possible. Uh, and, you know, things like professionalizing the you know the masjid helping new muslims uh you know all of these kind of these kind of like things that i think other charities maybe aren't doing as much as i would like um not to say that there aren't other charities but that there aren't as many whereas if i were to open one to do like disaster recovery or disaster relief or like you know they're a brilliant char- i would just be taking the like trying to squeeze in with a charity right. who's amazing right. you know like we got a crisis aid and people like that this is, you know beautiful brothers doing great work I wouldn't want to kind of like muscle in on that. Like I want to do something in my own field. So a lot of it's online projects. We're retranslating uh, the Quran uh, to provide a better, higher quality translation based on what's already there. So we're not removing the the wonderful work that's been done by the the other people, but but trying to like improve it in terms of the quality of the English, the understandability. Uh, the choice of language and also the accuracy in relation to tafsir, providing loads of books for free, um, open sourcing like stuff out on the internet, uh, ways, new ways to learn Islam, better ways to memorize the Quran, uh, you know, improving the situation of the masajid and the local community centers and, you know, best practices for them, like all this kind of stuff. Like so there, there are so, so many projects Um We've got a, a project coming up, which is an online dawah type project, which is basically providing materials for people to be able to use on their social media feeds and things like that to give to give dawah. Because okay. one of the things we see it's really really terrible is that people often spread wrong information and they really want good, you know, like they really want to spread good stuff, but they need like good quality materials. So just like totally free, um, royalty free, like you know, good quality material that people can share with other people and be confident that it's that it's you know reliable that they can share with non-muslims who maybe they don't know how to approach or how to talk to and they can have like so we've got some some media campaigns that people can just take and put out there but all this stuff is up and coming because at the moment until really i finish work with islamic center it's difficult for me to get it fully up and running sure. we've got the registered charity status alhamdulillah um in terms of donations i'm i never ask for donations okay. i'm like I'm a person that, look, if someone wants to get involved, alhamdulillah, they're more than welcome. I'll never stop someone. If someone wants to donate, they're more than welcome. But I I really have a pet hate of people asking for right. things, you know, like, and um, for us, we don't need a lot of money, alhamdulillah. Like, it's not a project that needs millions and millions. It's a project that needs, you know, a little bit every now and again, you know, just like topping up every now and again. Sure. So a lot of it is online and we let other people. So, for example, we might... Uh, produce this DAO material and if people want to print it they're welcome to take it print it distribute it in the local area as much whatever right. funds they have right. but the material is there it's online for free so that's the kind of way we do it now at the moment it's been through a number of revisions because I started it off with an idea and it didn't quite work the way I wanted it to and that website kind of at the moment it reflects kind of some of the old stuff we've improved it um, we've got you know try, I'm trying not to bring too many people on board right now and the reason is I think if you bring people on board too early before you yourself are organized and have the idea, it just turns into like organized chaos. You okay. know? Like, so I'm trying to get myself like fully organized with what I want to do project by project. I've got a few limited people that help me like in certain fields. I've got someone looking after the new Muslim side, someone, but just very limited. Um, and, you know, it's it's my long term project. So my vision, inshallah, is when I finish my work with Islamic Center, 
um, and I'm still doing it now, but obviously when I finish, you know, really to push this all the way. And, and the main reason I made it a charity is that I don't want to benefit. I made myself a trustee so that legally I can't benefit from the from the donations and I can't take anything from it. Okay. Because people mm-hmm. used to come and give people used to come and give uh, donations to me, like for things like Rukia. And I used to just put it in a pot and give to the, you know, to whoever. And I thought, you know what it is? Wouldn't it be better if we saved these donations and used them for something really amazing? So I said, right, let me open a charity. And that way, there's no temptation for me because legally I can't, I can't touch it anyway. Like I can't take a salary from it. I can't take an income from it. And that means that helps me. You know, it's another reason why I don't push for donations because I, it's not like I'm asking for a, uh, for a salary or right, something. Right, you right, know, right, like right. I'm, this is like literally just what I need to keep the project going. Some ser- server costs that I pay every month. To, and it helps you purify your attention. You know, and I just wanted something that doesn't, you know, I wanted something that doesn't involve work. You know, alhamdulillah, if you've been given a profession, like, you know, I, at the moment I work in Dawah because that's a, an opportunity came to me. But, you know, if you've been given a profession by Allah, as a wajal, I, I, you know, that's what I would like to do. I wouldn't like to kind of have to go to like charity work and things like that as to as a means to earn a living. So, you know, the foundation is is very much in planning in early stages in the sense that we've got projects ongoing. We are producing material, but it is like very, very drip, drip, drip. And people sometimes say like, oh, man, you've been three years. You haven't produced anything. But it, it's drip, drip, drip at the moment. But inshallah, there'll come up a tipping point when it becomes like, inshallah, all that material becomes available. And, and bathing light to Allah, we start, you know, snowballing it and it becomes something, you know, really beneficial, inshallah. And once it is ready, um, the website is? The website's there right now. Okay. It's just out of date. Uh, but it's humblefoundation.org. Oh, right. And your personal website? Um, my personal website is mohammedtim.com. Perfect. M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D. Tim.com. So that's how people can p- keep updated with you. And both of them are terribly up to date, but I'm working <laughs> on each other. And a lot, I have if a lot of projects. If you help with them, honestly, please do ask. I would love to be able to uh, in hand with websites uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, like I said, most of the problem is content rather than, like, it's not like, I, I'm, alhamdulillah, loads of people do website design, but it's Fine. just like, it's more like getting the time to sit down and do the content. And, you know, we just do what Allah makes easy for us. Keep trying. Like we talked about earlier, when you sometimes struggle to do something, we just keep trying, trying, trying. You just have sabr until Allah opens the door. But, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm really excited about the projects that are coming up. Barakallah fikum. Well, Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble, Jazakumullah Khair for jumping on the podcast and for dedicating time to us. You're a very busy man. And alhamdulillah, this is something that we wanted for a very, very long time. And inshallah, there were so many different topics that we didn't even delve into. You did a, a, a class on um, the traps of the shaitan. We didn't go into that and, and, and the whole Rukia stuff. And so inshallah, if you're ever in the UK or back in the UAE, please do. Yeah. Uh, come, and inshallah, this time Sam can be on it as well. Yeah, so. for sure, inshallah. Why not? Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh. Barakallah. It's a pleasure. Barakallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.